All right, so guys, first of all, um, we weren't able to get to everything. Um, so we got to like halfway through, we got all the way through most of the grip stuff. Um, I didn't really look into sliders too much yet. So we'll talk about that. Um, and the uh, tips and stuff for low budget, we got about halfway through some of the resources we had. So we will be looking that up and be finishing anything if there's any new information in any of that we'll be talking about it on thursday <clears throat> so we'll just go through what we uh what we learned and then um talk about that stuff thursday so the first thing we're talking about is grip equipment there's a bunch of different kinds of stuff that you want to look into um we're not going to look into every single thing like <clears throat> excuse me like like if you are working grip you want gloves of course but those kinds of things, like we've already talked about that in a previous semester, like all the different things that a grip, a key grip would want or a gaffer would want. So um, this time we're just going to be talking more about like the different tools that are used that can be used by anybody, especially if you're having your own, um, if you're making your own production company or something like that. Or if you're doing an independent production and you're not really going to have a grip department, these are some of the things you really want to have so that you have all of these rigging op capabilities. Um, to set up different stuff and uh, have your lights or your camera set up in different ways so that it all looks good. So the first thing we're starting out with when we're talking about grip stuff is the C-stand. There's two types of C-stands. There's what's called a turtle base stand, which allows you to remove the risers, which leaves just the base. So if you look at this picture, the bottom part with those three legs is the base. Then you have that middle pole that rises kind of like any other stand you'll have where you untwist it, raise it up, and then twist it to lock it in place. Um, that's the risers. That's the riser area. And then you have um, on top, you have the um, extension arm coming through that grip head, which is the little part that you put the extension arm through. So all of that together is the C-stand complete. So if you're going to go buy a C-stand, um, one thing you should note is if you just buy a C-stand, some of them will just come with the legs and just come with the riser, and they won't include the um, grip heads or the extension arm. But a C-stand complete, if that is what they call it, that, it, that means it comes with the whole thing, everything you see in this picture. So just keep that in mind. Make sure that whatever you're buying, you know what you're buying. You don't have to buy extra stuff. Some of the higher end stuff, you might start buying, thinking that it's only, you know, 200 bucks for this brand thing and I'll go ahead and buy it. But then it ends up, it's just the legs and the risers. And then you have to spend more money to buy that extra, um, the grip heads and the extension arm to go with it. And so it will add to the price. So you need to just know that beforehand. So you're not buying something and then having to spend more money to complete the package. Um, but if you already know it and you still want it, then you at least have the uh, full cost um, in advance that you know. So there's the turtle base, which allows you to actually take the riser out of it. And then it just has those that stand. So you can actually put um, like a camera there or a light there really low down to the ground where it's just on that base. And then you have the third leg adjustable ones, which allow you to raise the third leg up that pole which uh, will allow you to put it on places like stairs or anywhere where one leg needs to be at a higher level. Maybe it's on some shelf and the other two are on the ground where well, you can raise up one leg all the way up so that it's resting really firm and stably on whatever you need. So those are the two main types. I've seen, I, I feel like I've seen some that can do both, but I'm not hundred percent on that. Um, but those are the two that they, they were talking about in, in all these resources. So those are two to look out for. If you want to be able to adjust one leg up and down and, and um, that gives you more versatility and where you can place the thing, especially if you're in a little, a real tight space that has different levels of things, you can raise up one of the legs and put it on something and then back the thing up wherever you need it to go um, so that it all works. But if you're able to and you want to have a separated piece, you have more versatility and being able to take out everything and just have that base with the three legs, 
then you could have some really low to the ground lights or a camera set up or something like that, just using that three legs. And those three legs are very um, sturdy and they're very stable. So that it's a good uh, base to have for different things. Um, as I already said that. So one thing you wanna always look out for, especially with this kind of stuff is the load capacity or the max weight or the payload. Those all pretty much mean the exact same thing, which is how much weight it's able to handle while remaining stable. So if you have a really heavy camera and you have a really heavy, or you have a really heavy light um, and you're trying to rig up a bunch of different things to this thing, just make sure it's able to handle that weight without becoming unstable. You can always add a sandbag to one of these legs to make it more stable, but you just wanna be sure that whatever the max weight is that it's able to handle, you don't go over that because if you do, it has the chance of bending or breaking or loosening that uh, arm. And, that, and then it would just, maybe your camera would fall over and break and all of that. So you just always wanna be sure to check out how much your stuff weighs, what you're gonna be using on it and how much it is able to handle. You also wanna leave some buffer room in between the two. You don't wanna, if it has max weight of, it can handle 30 pounds of weight. You don't wanna have stuff that's 29.9 pounds and be like, well, I'm good, I'm gonna use that. Try to get one that can handle a bit more weight or try to lessen your load so that there's a little more buffer room there because you don't ever wanna to get to that max just in case. You always wanna leave some extra pounds um, of weight off so that there's a little buffer room in case you didn't do the calculations correct or the thing can't actually handle 30 pounds. It can only handle so and so many, but it's basically 30 and all those types of things that could happen. So you always wanna have a little bit of extra buffer room there. Good C stands are typically made from solid steel and the heavier they are, that's the sturdier that they are, typically speaking, because there's more weight holding the whole thing down. Another thing you wanna consider when you're talking about C-stands is how high does it rise? The standard C-stand that you will get rises to about 40 inches, but with that extension arm, of course, you can raise it up higher. You can uh, have whatever your light up higher with the extension arm pointing up, but the, uh, the risers and the, and the base itself will rise to about 40 inches on the standard C-stand. So if you need it to go higher than that, you have to make sure to look for one that specifically goes higher than 40 inches. And then the extension arms that you'll get that go in there are typically three to six feet long. And whenever you're using one of these C-stands, you wanna make sure that you um, are balancing it correctly. And that means you're not extending the arm completely out to the other side. You wanna leave kind of like in this picture, maybe not that much room on the other side, but you wanna leave maybe like a foot of space just so that there's, just so everything's not hanging off to the other side because that'll make the uh, balance a lot worse. Cause you also want to put a counterbalance on one side, most of the time, like a sandbag or something like that to hold down one side while the camera or the light or whatever you're rigging to the other side is um, evenly balanced and it's going to be a lot more stable that way. These are pretty expensive. Um, like the cheaper, like cheaper ones, uh, quote unquote cheaper. They're around like $116. And that's for like the knockoff brands or the ones that aren't really a brand. And then if you get into the brands, they can go to 200, 300, 400 and more. So they are really expensive, but they're definitely an, they're definitely an investment, um, but they last for years. Usually if you take care of them properly, they can last for years. They're very durable and they can, they're very versatile and you can use them in many different applications. So they are something that everybody says you, you most likely need. So you just wanna be aware of that. They're also very heavy though. So if you're going for portability, like you're constantly going to be doing scenic shooting or something, and you're going to be going places all over the place, then uh, this might not be what you want to go for because they're not very portable as much as some other stands. You might just want to go for a standard light stand if that's the case. These C stands can be quite heavy and they can be pretty bulky. So 
they're typically used more for studio set locations and like you know going from one spot to another but not like traveling and carrying it all around because that'll start to get annoying after a while um let me see what i have right here oh as you can see if it's all taken apart <clears throat> and you have the grip heads on the right top right you have the base on the top left you have the center column or the risers right below that. And then you have the extension arm on the bottom. So that's it all if you take it apart. So you can see each piece. Something you might wanna consider also is that some of these will have a like a spring cushion in the risers. So that, that part right below the legs and the, and the heads right here with that little black grip. Um, when you unscrew those, those pieces, they'll have little springs. They can have little springs that will kind of uh, stop it from smacking together if somebody accidentally lets it go and it's loose, or if it comes loose all of a sudden and it goes down, it'll have less of that like smack and it'll bounce a little better and be a little more, um, it'll, it won't really like damage anything, but also your fingers, if you have your fingers there, it helps to uh, not, not pinch your fingers. If you, if you have them in between where it's going to smack. Some of these don't have that though. So they just go ahead and go down and smack. And if you have your fingers there, you will get pinched and it'll be, you know, it'll hurt. And it also, if you don't have your fingers there, it'll smack together and it'll cause everything to shake a little bit more. Um, it can possibly damage the C-stand, but like I said, these are pretty durable. So they usually don't break from that kind of thing, but whatever's on the C-stand itself might wiggle around and it might cause some instability issues. So. It is something to consider. Um, the other thing is like you can see in this picture, it has that padded area. It just makes gripping it a little bit easier. Some are just metal. I think the one, oh no, that one has padding as well. But there's some that just have that metal part on the risers. I think maybe this one. And then it won't have that pad. So it's not really that big of a thing, but it will be a little bit easier to grab the one that has the kind of the uh, cushion, the padded area. And then lastly, when you're setting these up, um, I would recommend watching one of the videos in the syllabus to kind of see how they do it. Everyone turns it upside down. For the most part, most of them turned it upside down and then opened the legs up and then flipped it back over. Um, usually what you do is you have to manually grab each leg. You grab like the third and the first leg, you pull it, then you grab the second leg with the third leg and you pull it. And that way it extends out in this picture, kind of like that, where it's all separated. Um, but some of them, you actually have these spinnable legs where you unlock a little mechanism at the bottom and you just have to twist it and all the legs unravel themselves. So that can, you know, it can be a little bit of a time saver and just make it a little bit quicker and easier to set up. It's not really necessary, but it is something that you might want to consider. Um, and Think about when you're trying to buy a new C stand for the first time. Is that that just makes it a little bit easier to set up? It's also a little bit. I think I think it's a little safer because you can actually point the legs away from you while you're doing it. Um, but as I said, it's not really that big of a of a thing. That's all I really had on C stands. Does anybody have anything to add or questions or comments? Uh yeah. Like I mean, as you had mentioned. Um... They come at different different prices, um, but you know, in my experience, I, I've seen some expensive ones that have fallen apart. So don't really take too much um, time trying to figure out, trying to find the, the right, the perfect C stand. Cause you know, it's just at the end of the day is the piece of equipment. Oh, <laughs> that, that's not kind of, it's a, it's not, you know, it's, a, it's just like, it's just this, um, it's a piece of metal. <laughs> that's that's all it is at the end of the day. I mean, you want a good piece of metal, but yeah, like it. You, I'm not saying buy cheap, don't buy expensive. Like, but I am saying don't you know consider. Oh, like I have to have the most expensive C stand. Um, right. I know it might not um, even be better. Actually, there was a yeah. one of the videos showed that one of the ones that were more expensive actually had less of these features. I was just saying, like the the springs and all of that wasn't in the more expensive one. So yeah. sometimes it doesn't really 
matter if it's more expensive. It's just about how much they're charging for it and the brand. So that is, yeah, and I definitely agree. The spring is is kind of like a new thing now that's coming in some of the newer products. So like um, we had, you always mentioned uh, that company newer. Yeah. And you know, I, I like I said, I, I I've said it before. I I like that company. It's kind of um, they make affordable equipment and it, they're like you know a trustworthy brand. So when you see newer, like if you're not sure, you know, you'd be like, well, let me just see, let me just get the newer, because you know they make cheap. They, it's cheap, so it's like you buy it and it's just like, if I if I like it, then I'll keep it. If I don't, then maybe I'll try to spend a little bit more money and buy another one. But like newer is a company you can you could put your money on and, and kind of gamble your money with so they make um they recently started making their own c-stands i have a couple of them and they're they're not bad at all they have the springs in them um a little bit more heavier than i than i wanted them to be but you know they they are beneficial to me at all um they also have um i don't think you mentioned um at the end of the arms some of them like the older ones you know the arms are just the arms but some of the newer ones they make um the little thread mounts um come at the end of the arm so you can attach like microphones and um tripod heads and all that kind of stuff on it as well oh yeah yeah the little baby pin adapters or the the uh screws and all that yeah i think yeah some of them come with the i don't know what the sizes are i think it's like three fourths inch screw or something or the where yeah. you screwed on, and then the other one, yeah. the eights, whatever the eights one is. Yeah, the bigger one. Yeah, there's mm -hmm. two different sizes, and um, the one I have, like it has one, it has a three fourths in on one end, and then the, the bigger side on the other end. So it's up to you to choose like which one you want to go go with. I thought that was pretty cool too. They just kind of recently started doing that with the uh, the new tripod heads. I mean, not, I said tripod, the new um, extension arms the extension arms yeah that's kind of like a new feature they started adding so is the spring as well they um to add to that the spring it kind of helps absorb impact so like you said if it drops and you have a heavy light on there it looks you know if there's no spring in there it'll just drop and then it'll just bounce somewhere but you know with the spring in there it helps absorb it so it'll bounce right back up and keep it from falling you know um, hopefully yeah yeah hopefully saving the light <laughs> whatever light right. fixtures on there <laughs> But yeah, it's just, you know, it's just a piece of metal. Don't go overboard with it. Oh, you know, I have to, if it's not $300, it must not be good. That's not, that's not the case. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, some of the brands that you'll find with C-Stands is Matthews, Avenger, Kupo. Um, also, like Brian said, there's newer. But these three are a bit more of the, like, professional ones, if you're looking for that. But like you said, you don't have to always go for the most professional. And people even said that, um, actually, it wasn't one of these brands, but there was one brand that is well known for making C stands that the guy was adamant that he didn't like it. And uh, he said just the way they make it, even though it's more expensive, it's not as good. So I always want to look I into that, the reviews. Yeah, I would recommend always looking at the reviews because just because it's more expensive doesn't mean it's good. But that said, any piece of metal is also not going to work because... You want something that's sturdy. You want something that's safe. You want something that can work for what you need as well. So yeah, I don't because think you're potentially you could be rigging up some really uh, crazy things on here that are really heavy yeah. and stuff. So you want to be able to make sure that it's going to handle it, which is why you want to look at that max load capacity and everything. One last thing when you're actually using these is um, the biggest leg, you want it pointing forward to wherever you are putting your light or whatever you're putting onto that extension arm. You want the weight of it going towards the biggest leg because it has the most stability for that. Uh, if you put it towards one of the smaller legs, it's more likely that it'll start falling over and have instability quicker. So aim whatever you're putting on there towards the biggest leg or aim the biggest leg towards wherever you are putting the light or whatever you're rigging up to it, and it'll give it more stability. And then when you're putting a sandbag on it, you want to put it on the biggest leg as well so that it's actually hanging on there. Um, so all the weight is going to the stand and none of it is just sitting on the ground because you want that weight actually holding down the stand. So those are the two things. Oh, and then like the last thing was the extension arm. When you are putting it on, you want to put the the thing with the weight, like the light, towards the side that's going to tighten it 
on the right. So righty tighty, lefty loosey. You want to put it on the right way so that it's if it starts being heavier than what you expected, it's going to only tighten that pull instead of being on the other side where it's going to loosen it and uh, possibly fall over or hit into the middle of the pole or something like that. So those are two things, but you can look at like the actual how to use these. Um, and we even talked about this last semester, but I just thought I'd bring that up again. Going on from that, we have Apple boxes. Now Apple boxes come in four different sizes. There's the full, which is on the bottom, the half on the right above that, quarter right above that, and then the eighth, or AKA the pancake, which is the one on top. The full is 20 inches long from the left to the right. It is 12 inches wide from the closest to the picture to far away, and it is eight inches high. So from where it's laying flat to the top of that, eight inches. Then you have the half, which is 20 by 12 by four inches. So it's exactly half the height. If you're laying all these flat, it's half the height of the full box. And then you have the quarter, which is 20 by 12 by two inches. And then you have the pancake, which is 20 by 12 by one inch. So if you buy an Apple box set, you're gonna get all four of these boxes. You're gonna get all four of these um, together, but if you just, or you can buy them individually, buying one or the other. And usually typically people might start out with just the full box instead of buying a whole set, but it just depends on what you're going for and what budget you have. And then there's also these nesting options. Um, some of them have like this, like this, these, some of them have like this where it saves a lot of space because the smaller boxes actually go inside of the biggest one. There are some um, cons with that, but I'll get into that in a minute. Um, so Apple boxes are used to prop up anything that needs it, like equipment, different stands, things like that. They can be made for makeshift, makeshift step ladder or somebody to step on and reach a light or whatever, making an actor seem taller. You know, Tom Cruise, they did that. They put him on an Apple box whenever he needed to be intimidating looking. Or just next to a female coaster. <laughs> <laughs> it's also for, um, they all, these are also used by a lot of crew members or actors to place things on, sit on, things like that. So they're used all over with everybody on set. Um, so as, with these full boxes anyway, the other ones are mainly used by the grip department, but the full box is used a lot by everybody. And so they are really important and really useful on set to have places, things to place and things to, if you need to raise up anything, if you need to have somewhere to sit stuff, if you need to sit down yourself, you know, these are really good to have. This stuff comes from Matthew's studio equipment. Um, well, these next things come from Matthew Studio Equipment, and I think it's K, yeah, it's K in the syllabus. They say, um, well, Matthews, first of all, it's a well-known brand that makes different pieces of um, studio equipment, and one of the things they make is Apple boxes. They make them with nine, they make theirs with a nine-ply Baltic birch wood, which they say gives it more flexibility and maintaining sturdiness because there's some people who will make their own and that's perfectly fine, but you just wanna make sure that if you're making your own, you're making it sturdy and you're making it well because you don't want that thing to bend too much. You don't want it to give in and break because that's a safety hazard, but you also don't wanna make it too heavy and too bulky. And you wanna make sure that uh, you get it when you're making them yourself, you want to try to get them to these standard sizes because it makes it a lot easier when you're needing to actually even things out and level them and everything. So uh, sticking with that 20 by 12 by eight and then going up the list really helps to uh, do that. Um, there's also these mini boxes that you can find which are half the size, half the length. So it, Instead of being 20 inches long, 20 by 12 by eight, instead it's uh, 10 by 12 by eight. So it's the same width and the same height as the other ones. They are just 
not as long. So they're, you can stack them. If you put them on their side, of course, they look like that. So they're half the size of the other ones. They're not used as often, but they are um, still used. But the typical ones are the standard ones that you'll see uh, on most sets, which is the big ones. Um, with a set of four boxes, you are able to raise things in one inch increments from one inch to 27 inches by using them separately or together. How that works is like we were talking about with the um, with how tall these are, if you're putting them flat like this, the one on the top, the pancake or the uh, eighth, it is one inch tall. So you can put that down if somebody needs to raise something by an inch. You know, hey, we need to put the tripod an inch taller. Can you help us? Yeah, here you go. And then if you need to do two inches, you just take that out of the way. You get the one next down, the quarter, and you put it down because it's two inches tall. If you need three inches, you bring the pancake back, put it on there. And if you need four inches, you take both those away and you give the the half one and you just keep going in that order, you know, just keep adding and taking away and you can go inch by inch. Eventually you'll turn the, uh, the full box on its side and you'll put the other ones flat and that'll just keep raising it all up until you're about 27 inches tall. So um, they really help whenever you're needing to have really small adjustments and be very accurate. You're able to mix and match these to raise things up or lower them inch by inch. So they're really helpful for that kind of stuff, especially when you're messing with things in a camera in frame. And all you need to do is just barely move this thing a little bit up or a little bit down. Well, not, I guess not down, but a little bit more high than uh, you want to use these Apple boxes too, because they're sturdy and they're easy to, to put down and they're flat. And so, yeah, they're good for that. Um, they, they recommend if you're able to, um, try to get four of each kind, so four sets total. That way, if you need to raise a table, a couch, or anything that has that, that four legs, like a, maybe a bed, you're able to do that evenly. You don't have to um, worry about trying to find another way to do it. You can just use these apple boxes to put it underneath whatever you're needing to raise. And again, you can raise it up inch by inch until they have it at the right height. Otherwise, they say start with one set because <clears throat> that's going to be good. And at the very least, if you can't do anything else, start with at least the full box because that's going to be used the most often. They also recommend even if you do get four of each kind, get two extra full boxes because uh, everyone on set is going to be using them to sit down or place their things. And sometimes they get lost on set or the director's using it or somebody's using it and you can't really use it for, you know, using it for like the actual raising things up or grip department and using it as a step ladder and those kinds of things. And so having some extra around typically help. Again, of course that is coming from Matthews and they do sell these Apple boxes on their website. So they, you know, want people to buy more. <laughs> but I would say that they're probably right on trying to get extras just to have uh, those different things, uh, those different capabilities and versatility for these. Now, this comes from gaffer and gear, and it's I in the syllabus. It's gaffer and gear 140, Kubo, Kubo Apple boxes. And he starts talking about these ones that are nested, and he's talking about the pros and cons of them. So the nested boxes, they don't have that middle piece. Um, like in the other ones, if you, would, if you were to look inside of it, you'd see about halfway through, especially, or at least on the full box, I'm not sure if all of them have this, but the full box will have like a center piece that kind of gives it a little more stability and, rigid, and rigidity um, to where it can withstand a little bit more weight especially because that's usually where people will stand is in the middle. So you want to have like a little bit of extra buffer room there. So there's a little piece of wood in the middle that sticks up in between. Um, while in this one, of course, because everything goes inside of it, they don't have that. So he said he's, he jumped on them and things and it worked fine and it didn't break. So he's not really too worried about it, but it is something to think about, especially if you're trying to like 
buy these once and then be done with it. If you want them to last for a really long time, you wanna maybe get the one that's a little more sturdy. <coughs> he says, because of that lid that comes off. So if you look on the picture on the top, that's the lid um, that will slide into place and have that little magnetized piece that locks it in so that it doesn't uh, come loose. But if you have this Koopa box on its side, like if you had it on the side furthest away from this picture over here, if you guys can see my cursor, if you had it laying on that side and you're trying to pick it up from the handles, then um, it's going to start sliding off as you grab it up. So that's something that gets a little annoying, he said. And you always wanna to try to place it on this side down if you're placing it sideways. That way, when you're picking it up from the handlebars, it will, from the holes, the handles, it won't uh, slide off as you're picking it up. Um, and nested boxes, the full box is the standard dimension. So it's the 20 by 12 by eight. But the other boxes, since they actually go inside of it, they have to be a bit shorter and a bit skinnier. So they aren't actually the standard sizes that you'll find and they don't all match. The three on the inside match, but they don't match the, uh, the full box to the, uh, the height and the, uh, or the length and the width. They have to be a little bit shorter and skinnier so they can fit inside of it. So they're not the same. So one negative of it is if you actually stack the two halves, the half box being on that bottom right here, if you stack that next to the full box, it actually doesn't make it even. With the standard boxes, it actually does. If you take this middle box or this uh, half box and you put it next to the full box and then you take another half box and put it next to it, it'll be the exact same height. It'll be completely even and it'll be completely flat. But with this one, because it's a little bit shorter and skinnier so that it fits inside, um, it's actually a tiny bit, like maybe less than an inch, but it still isn't the exact same height, which is a problem, especially if you need that leveling for any reason. If you're trying to put something bigger on it and you're trying to use two halves because you don't have another full, um, you can't really do that with these because it's a little bit shorter. So he said that can get a little bit annoying when you're trying to, when you need it. Um, so to me, it just sounds like it's very convenient and it saves a lot of space, but it does have some of those cons that um, come with saving that space, but it does save quite a bit of space if you look at this compared to that. Having, especially if you are gonna go ahead and get four sets of them, having this, um, you're gonna need a lot more room for like 16 of that than just having four packs of these all compacted together. And he finished the video by saying that he has eight sets of these ones just because he needs that room. So he's not like saying that he don't get them. He was just telling you what the cons are for, for it. <clears throat> One thing to look out for when you're buying these, especially if you're gonna get them from somebody who has handmade them, which they usually aren't able to do as well as these companies that make them professionally, is to make sure that it's level. So you want it to be completely flat. You want it to be completely even because um, if it's not, it could be leaning to one side or the other or have like a tiny little bump in the middle. And if you're needing it for whatever reason to, um, I don't know, if you, usually you need these to be level and you need them to be flat. So just be, pay attention to that because the professional companies like Coupo and Matthews and all that, they'll actually like press them down, making them flat and even. And some of the homemade ones or the lesser known brands or the smaller companies um, don't do that. And so they won't be able to be used for all of the same functions as these ones might be. But if you don't really care to need them for those types of reasons, like for being completely level, completely even, then um, it shouldn't really be a big deal. Like you can still raise the thing up. It'll still be pretty much the same height, but if you need it to be exactly right, then um, getting these higher known brands is probably what you want to go for. Um, and then lastly, it's just some of the brands that make them. I think I already named them, but 
Kupo and Matthews are the best known brands that make Apple boxes where you can go online and buy them or you can go on eBay or Amazon and you'll find those companies the most. <clears throat> Does anybody have any questions or comments about Apple boxes? All right, so the next thing we're talking about is clamps. There's a bunch of different oh, kinds. Uh, I oh. was I was uh, throwing something away real quick. Did you talk about like the whole Chicago, New York thing, blah, 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 and, and No, all that? because, well, we already talked about that last semester. I was talking more about the, so well, if, you you, if you put these on their side or if you put them flat or if you put them straight up on set, those are some terminology things that will, um, that if somebody says, hey, I want you to bring me an Apple box and put it in New York, then uh, you would place it a different way than you would if they said, hey, put it Chicago or LA. So basically LA is basically how it is right now. It's flat. Um, Chicago style is putting it on its side. So if we took it from the picture side and turned it, and then New York is placing it on its nose. So it's the tallest. So that's the two, three differences. I, I know we learned that first semester, but just like as a quick refresher since we're already here anyway. Yeah. And then if somebody says, bring me a half apple, the guy said, uh, one of the people were like, make sure you bring him a half apple crate and uh, a half apple box, I mean, and don't don't go to, to the craft table, cut them half an <laughs> apple and bring it back. If they so, ask for an, ap an apple, a half apple and a pancake, don't bring them food yeah <laughs> they will laugh in your face bring them this top box and bring them and that he one said the it like someone who had experience so <laughs> yeah he said it like he was made fun of for his entire career because of that <laughs> all right so the next thing we're talking about is clamps there's a bunch of different kinds so well, let's jump into it this one right here in the picture is an a clamp same as this a clamps there's different sizes there's some really really small and some really large. Um, actually, this picture shows it. So there's some like really tiny and there's some that are quite a bit bigger, but they all look the, the same. They look like an A. That's why they're called an A clamp. Um, the smallest ones, they're good to clamp like gels to lights or things like that. The larger ones, they could be used to tighten diffusion on a, to a frame or to a green screen, to tighten a green screen to make it flat. Um, they're used to hold up cables, um, attach them to poles or attach them to different parts of the whatever rigging you got going on just to get it out of the way. Some people clamp people's clothes if they have a baggy shirt and they don't want it to look baggy, they'll clamp the back of it or the front of it, depending on what part they are filming. And uh, that way it's a little bit tighter looking on them. And there's other multiple uses for these, but these are pretty much, you're gonna have, if you are in the grip department, you're gonna have a multitude of these. And if you're just buying them for your personal um, projects and for independent stuff, then you still probably wanna have quite a few just because you'll be using them more than you might think. So they're not really used for advanced crazy rigging, but they're just used to kind of get things out of the way and they're good to just clamp down and, um, use like maybe even used on craft table to clamp up some of the bags so stuff doesn't go bad from day to day like they're just used for everything pretty much next we have super clamp and it looks like that the super clamp it can be used to go to the end of a of a c stand to mount things to poles or by clamping it it's kind of like a jaw like figure so if you have that square um there's some of that like square pull, not necessarily the round stuff, but the square one, it's a lot easier to grip on this because it has that uh, really square jaw. So when it's clamping down, it's really, it's really good at clamping down on those um, square, square edges and things like that. Um, and then you have, um, so super clamps are usually used for like the square, square poles and stuff like that. But if you have round ones, you'll be looking at wanting to get maybe grid clamps, which we'll get into in a second. <clears throat> but 
these ones are good. They're, they're good at tightening. They usually have the little bolt at the bottom, which allows you to place like a, um, attach your camera or attach the light or whatever to it so that you can have something hanging off the bottom of it as well. Moving on from that, we have Cardellini clamps. Cardellini clamps look like this. Basically, they have these two little clamp parts that go up and down the screw. And then you have that little um, screw that you just hit to really get it to tighten. And then you just twist it until you feel like it's tight enough to hold on to whatever it's trying to clamp to. You have two different, uh, three different kinds of Cardellini clamps. You have the ones with the end jaw, which is the where the claw, the jaw is at the end like this. Well, shoot, that thing came up. There we go. You have ones with the mid, which has it in the middle. And then you have these little tiny ones that it were really zoomed in, but it's a lot smaller than something like that. And uh, these, they say that they're really good for getting into really tight places where you can't really grasp or like grab your hand around a, um, like a, like a, the jaw for the other ones where you have to clamp it down to get it to open and it doesn't have as much space to open like that. These are good because they just, they clamp together instead of going outward to clamp. Like if you were to use the super clamp, you have to like pinch it open and open it up that way and then get it shut. So if you're going behind a couch or something and there's like a little bit of space and there's only like a few inches, these are easier to grab onto something and then just tighten it because they're really small and really easy to uh, get around those kinds of things. Instead of needing something like this picture right here where you have to actually open it up and there's not, there might not be that much space for it. And then the little mini ones, um, little mini ones are good for like smaller stuff, of course. You don't wanna use the tiny ones for large rigging and like heavy equipment, but you just have something really small and you need to get it put up wherever, then these are really good to do that one for. Next, you have the platypus clamp or the duck bill or the duck clamp. There's a lot of different names to give into this one, but these are mainly used for grabbing things like reflectors, cardboard, foam, diffusion, or other large flat things that you don't want really to get bent. So you can see in this picture, they're kind of putting it around the table. Um, you can also put it, oh, there's no picture of that. Well, they use a lot to like hold up um, big pieces of styrofoam or cardboard or a reflector, just so that it doesn't bend it at all and it holds it in place. They're actually quite strong. As you can see in this picture, he's actually holding a light up just to a table. And so they're really good at clamping something that's really flat and has a lot of space and a lot of area. But they're also good at clamping stuff that doesn't really, that you don't want to be um, too tight or at too much of a angle. So they're really flat and easy for that, which is why they're good for, you know, big pieces of reflection and all that. Typically you'll need like a C stand to use it. Sometimes you can use it in cases like this, but oftentimes you're gonna need it to be connected to something for it to function the way that, it, that it's mostly used for, which is for those reflectors and for those big pieces of cardboard or whatever you're putting up. All right, next you got the C clamp and that's just to tighten one side to clamp it to many different things. You can clamp it to, um, one of the main things it's used for is to clamp into like those wood, um, what do you call it? Wooden beams at like the top of houses or top of a basement or something. They, these will typically be used. The, you have to make sure you tighten it a lot or it will slip though. And so because of that, you want to make sure that you're not going to damage whatever you're clamping it to. And so what they'll usually do is they'll usually put the, like if you were going to put it to a wooden beam on someone's house, they'll usually put like two little pieces of wood on each side. So that way you're not actually clamping the 
houses um, wood and beam because it might start damaging it. You're clamping these random pieces of wood that you already have on set. Um, so you want to take precautions when you're using these because they are very strong. Any of these clamps, I'd say take some precaution where you can, but stuff like this that's actually going to attach to the house and things like that or attached to you know, a table or something that can easily get damaged. You just wanna be sure to take that extra precaution when you're using it. One of the downsides about these is you, it takes a little bit longer to tighten because it's so big. Some of them are really small, some of them are really big. So it just depends on what size you get. If you're getting the big ones and you're loosening it up, trying to get it around something really big, then uh, it's just gonna take a little bit of time to unravel and, and then to uh, tighten back. They're also a little bit bulky, depending on the size you get, but they're necessary and they're great to have, just a bit harder to use. Oh, putting those two pieces of wood is called cribbing. So if you ever hear somebody talk about cribbing it, it just means putting two uh, pieces of wood or foam or something around whatever it's attaching to so that it's not damaging the thing it's clamping on. Next, we have a chain vice grip. And what this does is that chain comes loose and then you can put it around whatever you're putting it around to clamp it to and you tighten it to whatever you need to and then it clamps down on the chain so that it's really secure and really tight around um, whatever it is. And these are used just in like any kind of awkward situation where none of these other clamps might work. Um, they're really big and heavy though but they're very helpful to tighten those things that you can't really get anything else. And it's better than using a rope most of the time because it is a bit more sturdy because rope, it can uh, come undone or unravel if you, don't, if you don't do it right. But this is just easy and quick to get it around, tighten it, and then lock it in place. However, they say be cautious when using it because it can easily bend or ruin the things you attach it to. So again, if you're going to attach this thing to somebody's table, things like that, this one is really strong. So you want to make sure that you're not tightening it too much because once you lock it in place, it's going to get just a tiny bit tighter most of the time, as with most clamps and tools like that. So you want to make sure that you're doing it little by little so you're not going to damage anything because uh, it will ruin stuff and bend stuff really quickly if you just go ahead and tighten it as much as you can and then lock it in place. You could even break the table leg or whatever you're wrapping it around. So you wanna be careful with that. Um, then we have that grid clamp that I was talking about earlier. That one's a little bit more rounded as you can see and that's why it's good, a good option to put around pipe or different circular things. Usually it's some kind of pole or usually it's the rigging that you're gonna use, um, speed rail, things like that that you're gonna use on set. And all you do is you just flip that thing and then you twist it to lock it in place and it holds whatever it's grabbing to. And then it has that little piece at the bottom where you can connect the light or whatever you're trying to connect to the bottom of it. Then you have what's called a cheeseboro, <clears throat> similar to a grip clamp, a grid clamp, I mean, but it just made to connect one pipe to another pipe. And you have one that swivels, which will get, I think this one's the one that swivels where you can move them in any direction you want. And then you have one that's locked in place at a 90 degree angle. So you just wanna be sure if you are gonna get one of these, that you get the right ones. And, uh, you know, these are just used so you can connect different pipes to other pipes and it's used a lot for these big rigs where you might have a camera going across one way or you might need to hold up a light so you're making a huge rigging out of different pipes and and these uh grip clamps and all these things and you also have um where is it at this isn't really a clamp but it's a um spud adapter and if you look at the top, that part's going to be the, I think it's called the baby, um, baby pin. And then you have at the bottom, it's called the junior pin. So the different lights you use, almost all of them, 
if not all of them are going to use one or the other of these, especially with the uh, more professional standardized equipment. You're going to use mostly the junior pin for those. For cheaper stuff, you're going to use more of the baby pin, but both are going to be used on a multitude of different things used on a film set. So it's always good to have one or two or three of these so that if you are using any kind of equipment, you can adapt it to one or the other, depending on what you're trying to use. You can also see that they both have holes at the end. <clears throat> and this is used so that if you're putting a light up in here, you're gonna screw it on and it's gonna tighten at that part um, that is a little bit lower. If you can see my mouse, it's like right there. That's where the screw is gonna tighten on. That's when it can, where it's gonna like kind of clamp. And then you're going to put a little bobby pin or piece of metal or a screw or a nail or something. And you're gonna put it through that little hole. That way, if it does happen to come loose your equipment, it's gonna fall on that piece of metal and it's not going to go anywhere, hopefully. You know, it's gonna be protected from that. So that if it does get loose somehow, if it does come off or if it does unclamp, it'll uh, just fall on that piece of metal and not go anywhere. You have these things called baby nail on plate. Baby nail on plates, it's called baby because it has a baby pin. I'm pretty sure there's also junior, junior nail on plates. So if you ever see any of this equipment and it has the word baby before it, that's just the kind of pin size it's using. And if it has junior and it's the other one, so that's just something to note. Um, but it allows you to secure stuff to either like a wall or a ceiling by putting nails or screws in these little holes and actually attaching it to a wall or ceiling or some other flat surface. You can also, well, one of the per people said that you can also use it to um, create like a flat surface, maybe for somebody's elbow, if they're using their phone. Like if you see a shot of somebody using their phone in a film, they might have their hand, their elbow actually on a flat surface that has one of these connected to a C stand with a little flat board that allows them to just hold their hand there without you noticing it or hold their, put their elbow there without you noticing it. And uh, he also said that they sometimes use it for the director or the producer to have a place to put their laptop. So sometimes these things aren't actually used for like the gear. It's just used for these uh, different positions, different people for when they need like a area to put stuff or to play stuff, maybe even to eat if they don't have enough room or space then uh, they'll use maybe something like this but this is typically it's used to like attach something to a wall or to a ceiling you want to just always be aware of how much weight you're able to put on these different things because you know some things are going to be too heavy for these things to handle and they might tear out especially depending on what you're putting it into not all walls not all ceilings are going to have the same material you want to make sure you're putting it to somewhere where it's a lot more sturdy and not just drywall, where it might fall off or break off and uh, damage the place, but also your equipment. So those are some things to keep in mind anytime you're doing any kind of rigging or thinking about it at all. Just be safe, safety first with all this stuff. This so next thing is called scissor clips. And this is something you definitely wanna make sure you're only using something light. If you ever go into an office place <clears throat> and you look up at the ceiling, you'll have those like, not really sure what the material is, but basically drywall pieces um, that are really flimsy and you can just punch them out to get into the actual ceiling area. And then you have these uh, little metal slivers in between that attach them. So when you're hanging a light, you can't just use one of these like nail on plates or something like that because it's not going to be sturdy enough. It's not gonna attach. And there's not really anywhere else to use any of those other clamps we've just talked about. So they have what these uh, little scissor clamps that look like this and you just kind of, it's scissors because they come out like scissors and then you put them together and it becomes flat and you attach it to something like that to where you can hang a light, but they don't really allow for too much weight. So you also wanna be sure that you're not hanging anything that's too heavy, something kind of light, something that's not gonna bend it and break it and ruin the place. But if you're shooting in an office or you're shooting somewhere that's a business, they might have this kind of wall and this kind of ceiling. So having one of these tools for those just in case moments is really good. Um, so you can at least figure out something 
and some kind of lighting to do there instead of just using the light that's there, which is usually fluorescence, which look ugly on film. Another thing you have is what's called a wall spreader. And I haven't really seen too much on this, but what I'm assuming it is because of what it looks like is it goes from one wall to another so that it uses a flat surface, kind of like a shower pole. If you're putting one up and it doesn't have, and it's just flat around that area, it's gonna have basically the same setup where you extend one piece to another and make sure that it extends far enough to where it's not bending anything or breaking anything, but that it is sturdy enough to hold up something. So then you can put it across the wall, place cameras on it, that kind of stuff. And it's not gonna damage the wall, but it's also gonna leave it stable enough to allow weight to be put on it. But you know, I'm not 100% on that. I'm just making a, a, estimate, a guess, educated guess based on what I've seen and what it looks like it does. So if that's not what it does, correct me if I'm wrong. Next, you have what's called ears, corners, and then the speed rail. Speed rail's in the middle. That's the poles you'll use for dolly track. That's the poles you'll use to set up different rigs, make different framing. Um, and then you have the corners, which are the top right, top left, bottom right, bottom left. Um, yeah, bottom left, bottom right, top right, top left. Those are the corners. And then you have what's called ears. And those are those things in the middle. Basically, all this is, is it's somewhere um, the ears, you can attach it to a, um, a grip, uh, a grip head or something like that, where you can tighten that grip head and keep it really tight. And then you can also attach these different poles and these different corners and things to make a frame out of. Square frame, you can use it for diffusion, you can use it for... Um, I don't know, negative fill. I mean, there's tons of different use cases for this type of stuff, but if you're using all of these in conjunction, you're gonna basically make a square frame, like a picture frame almost. And you can decide how long, how big, what size, if it's a rectangle, if it's a square or whatever, but you're gonna use these pieces to uh, get that done because they have the, the nails and everything to really secure everything and make it all uh, work properly and, and not, come apart and be loose, but be really sturdy and uh, safe. And another tool they're showing in a lot of the videos is called safety chains. Again, this isn't really a clamp and neither was the last thing, but it's just more grip gear. Um, these are just used to secure lights and clamps and stuff to poles or to rigs. So if they come loose, it doesn't fall all the way. So you might have a, a light that you're putting up on a rig and you're putting it up on a maybe a c-stand and there's a you have some pole coming out that you're going to attach something to so you're using a, a one of those clamps and then you have the light coming out of that well with these you just put it around the pole and you put it around the light wherever it can fit um, wherever there's like somewhere like a loop that you can put it into so that way if it does happen to come loose if the clamp gives out you know, whatever happens, just in case, then it will fall, but it'll still hang off of these little safety chains. Um, so you don't want to actually hang something up off of these safety chains because that's not safe. And also it'll be really loose and, it, and it's not going to tighten it. These aren't used for really tightening everything. It's just used as a safety precaution so that if something comes loose or something starts to fall, it has one last step of safety and backup before it collapses and falls all the way and hits somebody in the head or breaks or causes a fire or whatever kind of problem that you don't want to happen on set. I think that, yeah, that's everything for the, that stuff. Does anyone have any questions, comments or anything to add or clamps? or the, uh, the wall spreader. A lot of this stuff can be found at Lowe's or Home 
Depot. Um, if you're good with like carpentry work, a lot of this stuff you could probably build your own. I'm not suggesting it, but I just know that I see a lot of things like when you look for specifically, mm -hmm. um, like certain clamps and stuff. You had one. You you had shown one one clamp that was like a mix between, um, it was like a, a vice grip, and I was I'm, I'm just like. It's just a vice grip, but like if you were to go to like B and H or somewhere to buy it, they would probably charge you like two hundred bucks for it. You know, just yeah, it's just because like, but like for me, like because I'm a mechanic and I work with a lot of these tools, like I, I recognize them. I'm like, well, I, I know the true value of it, but you know, people that don't have any knowledge of tools and stuff might go and. I'm very good to record it, so sometimes I always. Oh, so spend okay. hundreds of dollars on stuff that's not even necessary trying to find it on like whatever film site you know right film site so. right that's and i would say one of the main differences i would i would say one of the main differences i've seen for um just regular use case and film use case is a lot of the film stuff will come with these little baby pins at the end or something like that that way you can also attach a light but that's not always necessary. And like you said, it's just gonna up the price quite a bit. So it just depends on what you think you need it for. But um, but yeah, there's definitely some of this stuff is just basically like tools that a carpenter would use or somebody who's building things, any kind of stuff um, would use this kind of thing. But that is something to also look out for if you want a tool that can do a lot more, if you want it to do like specific, specific stuff for film, some of the tools will have extra like, like this one has two ends of the bobby pin or the baby, baby pins that uh, will help attach it to lights or different poles. But if you were just going to buy something like this, it doesn't really have that. It just has the chain, but it can still work for what you need it to, to attach all this stuff and to tighten it and get it all secure. The main thing about all this stuff is just securing it and finding some way to rig it, rig it up. That's what the grip department's for. Um, finding a way to get the lights in a place that wouldn't normally be able to get it there. That's all it is. It's just finding different ways to do that. Not always lights, but you know what I mean? It's just trying to find a way to get the uh, system rigged up if it's poles or if it's lights or if it's a camera trying to find how to do it and all of these different tools have a specific use and can uh, be used for different things. And once you start actually, if you do start actually doing all of it, you will start to see the different use cases for them and when you might need one over the other. Like you wouldn't wanna use this on that table. This one's not gonna cause as much damage as this one might unless you do that cribbing thing. And then even then it might not be as secure depending on what kind of equipment you're using, or maybe it's more secure. So you just wanna be thinking about all that and you'll start to notice it if you start using all these different tools and start to see that some of it is, uh, has better use cases for different scenarios than others. Um, like the last thing you wanna do on a set, especially if you're on location at someone else's place, is damage anything. So making sure everything stays safe and you leave it the way it was found is like paramount whenever you're trying to do any of this kind of stuff which is why you know that, that this is why one of the reasons why filmmakers and filmmaking gets a bad rep when it comes to locations because they'll come in they'll set up this huge camera rig and all of these different things they'll leave and then there's holes or dents and everything has you know bumps on the floor and there's dents in the wall and they hung up something and they didn't plaster over it. So there's just holes where they put all their nails, and, you know, all these things that they should have done or brought it back to the way it was before they had gotten there uh, is why you might have people that, that know about filmmaking and know about new filmmakers where they might be less inclined to let you do it because they are more used to that kind of thing happening on um, less experienced sets mainly, but also maybe even larger sets. Okay. Next thing we're gonna talk about is 
Da -da -da. Yeah. Sandbags. If this will load. I didn't load. That's weird. Well. That's weird. Let me just look it up there. All right, the next thing we're going to talk about is sandbags, and they come in different sizes. There's the picture that was supposed to be showing. But uh, anyway, sandbags are used to help stabilize stands by adding weight to them or giving counterweight to the arms or extensions. So these are especially useful and especially needed whenever you're using big equipment and where you, when you're using things like the um, C stands. You're going to see a lot have these sandbags on them and then they have the counterweight with a sandbag or something at the end of the arm that's extending out that has the light attached to it. Cranes, things like that. Everything that needs a counterweight usually will use something like a sandbag or they'll use actual weights like you would see in, in a, uh, with someone working out. But sandbags are used all over the place and they're used just to really secure things down whenever they need that extra stability in case it's a little flimsy, especially when you have these um, light stands like this, like in this picture, that uh, aren't the most sturdy and most, aren't the most stable whenever you have bigger equipment on it. Sandbags will help to really weigh it down to keep it locked in place. It's not always just so that it's um, about it falling over and breaking. It's also just so if anybody bumps into it, it doesn't move out of place. So that's another thing you don't want. You don't want the lighting to change. Or if you have a camera attached to a tripod, you don't want the, um, the framing to come out of place because then it's gonna take more time and be more annoying to try to figure out exactly where you had it. So sandbags will also help to keep it in the same position, even if someone bumps into it and it's less likely that it's gonna get it out of place than if you didn't have them. But for the most part, these are used for making sure that the equipment's not gonna fall because you have this very expensive lights, you have this very expensive camera. You wanna make sure that it's not gonna fall over if somebody bumps into it or if something goes wrong or if the stand just isn't stable enough. You wanna make sure that uh, your equipment's safe because that stuff's really expensive and you don't want it to get broken. So that's what this stuff is used for. You can fill sandbags with rice, rocks, dirt, or sand, or anything that's going to fill it up. Um, I've heard people have put water bottles in them, something that just gives it some more weight. Of course, if you use something like rocks, rice, dirt, it has, um, it's going to use up the whole bag, which is actually going to give it more weight than if you use something that, like a water bottle, or a few water bottles, which aren't going to um, distribute everywhere exactly the same. So it's not going to be as much weight as you would if you had a actual things like that to put in like rice and stuff or, or sand. When you buy them, of course, they come empty. So you have to fill them yourself. You can get sand from like Home Depot and things like that, or you can get rocks. Or if you have a house, you can just go out in your yard and start grabbing some stuff and putting it in there. They say um, you if you're using these, you might want to use Ziploc bags to actually place the contents in. So if you do use rice, rocks, dirt, or sand, you might want to put them in a Ziploc bag. Just make sure the Ziploc bag is uh, able to handle that weight and isn't going to break open. But then you can put that inside of the sandbag, and that way the sandbag isn't going to get ruined on the bottom. So if you put the material directly into it, like sand, um, the zipper could get caught up with sand and the bottom of these corners of the sandbags could start to wear and tear and then eventually have a hole. So they just say like putting it inside of a <clears throat> Ziploc bag is, is something that you might want to consider. And that actually comes from Tom Antos, letter P in the syllabus. Uh, there it is. Film production tip, sandbags. So he just goes over some of these things. And I, I think I only have like two tips from him, but anyway. He suggests getting eight and says usually they come in sets of four as well. Then we have this coming from slanted lens. This is the letter R in the syllabus. 
and studio equipment, sandbags, quick tip. It's the video. There's sandbags with handles vertically, and then there's sandbags with handles horizontally. And he recommends getting the ones with handles horizontally. So these ones that we're looking at in this image actually have them going vertically. And he likes them going the other way. I think this one shows it because when you're picking them up, when you're pulling that strap up, the sandbag itself starts to come undone. So it just makes it a bit easier to grab off of the stand than something like this, where when you start picking it up, it's actually going to clamp together and you don't want it to pull the light stand or anything like that. Um, these should be one of the last things you're taking off. You shouldn't take it off before you take your camera down and everything, but just to make it a bit easier and less frustrating, he just likes the ones that are like this, that go horizontally because they just pull apart when you grab it up and it makes it easier to, to uh, take off of everything. 20 pounds is around the standard weight that you'll get when you get sandbags, but it can go up, it can go down to like, five pound bags, 10 pound bags, depending on how small they can get. Um, and then it goes up to, you know, it, it can go up crazy amounts. Like the standard sizes you'll get is 15, 20, 25, or 35 pound bags, but it can go up to like 200 pounds if you need it. Hopefully, you know, you don't really need that anytime soon because that'd be a pain. But if you do, there are options out there for that. They're just probably gonna be more expensive because they're less common. So they're not sold as often, but the standard is like 20 and 20, 25, somewhere around there. And then you have what's called shot bags. Right there. Shot bags are filled with, um, what's it called? Like, I think it's lead. And that actually gives it more weight for a comp more compact area. So the little shot bags are actually a lot smaller. So it's still 20 pounds. It's just a lot smaller, more compact than a sandbag would be. So that's something to consider if you need it. Um, there are certain case uses where you might need that, but still the standard is sandbags because they are more cheap. They are more cheap, they're cheaper. Um, And then going back to C stands real quick, I think we had actually going back to C stands real quick. I'm just going to right here. So you do want to put the, I don't know if I already mentioned this, but you do want to put the sandbag on the largest leg. That way it is hanging in the air. And that way all of the weight is on that C stand. It's pulling the C stand down like that. Um, if you put it on the smaller ones, it's hanging on the ground and that doesn't really, it's not really as effective because then the stand can still come up a bit before it catches on that sandbag. But if you're actually putting it like this where it's hanging down, it'll uh, have the most weight. And then if you need even more weight, they say to put another sandbag over that one. And then if you need more weight, then you can put an, a third one on one of the back legs. But that was just something I wanted to mention real quick because uh, they pointed it out so many times. Put it on the front leg, it'll be the most stable and it'll hold down the weight the best. Same thing when you're talking about, um, where is it? Same thing when you are talking about, ah, here we go. When you're talking about these kinds of stands, you want to put the sandbag in the middle like this. You don't really want to put it on the outside because it's, it can slip off. I think he's actually showing it right here. Um, this is slanted lens. This is the guy who does who has all these tips, by the way. And he's the one that everyone was pointing to because he made the video about it, mostly. mostly. Putting it like this, it has more of a chance to fall down, slip off. So you typically want to put it in the middle so that it has less of a chance to do that when you're using that kind of stand. Um, Cause that will slip off, but putting it in the middle, it'll be secure and weigh the whole thing down. So if you're using some light stand like that, that's just how you should put the, the sandbags to keep it more secure. Does anyone have any questions or comments about sandbags? 
Matthews again, Matthews and Kubo, some of the brands you'll find for sandbags. So these two brands keep popping up on a lot of this gear. They make a lot of this stuff. I've never I've never experienced a sandbag that at some point didn't start leaking or start, you know, deteriorating or falling apart. Mm -hmm. Um once again, it just goes back to everything else we've been saying earlier about, you know, not looking for the perfect sandbag and, you know, just, it's just one of those things where, you know, um, this doesn't really have to cost you a lot of money. I mean, if you want, you could look for more durable things, but at the same time, like you shouldn't spare no expense on um, a lot of this stuff. So. Yeah, because for the most part, a lot of this stuff will get the job done if you're using it properly. And, you know, wear and tear will happen to any of this stuff, especially if you're using it all the time, which is why it could be also a good choice to just get something a little bit cheaper and then just buy another one instead of going for the most expensive and it breaking. And just because, like Brian said earlier, just because it's more expensive doesn't necessarily mean that it's going to last longer be more durable or not wear and tear the same as the cheaper ones so always 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 check the reviews just see uh, what people are saying about it and check the more detailed reviews that give it more opinion than just this is great because those could just be bots if you've ever uh, gone on a website for reviews you can see a lot of that type of stuff and you don't really know if you can trust it or not if it's just somebody saying awesome love it compared to somebody saying why they love it and all of that. Moving on from sandbags, we're gonna talk about dollies. This is from um, Premium Beat by Shutterstock. So there is a way where you can make a do-it-yourself dolly. Let me actually go to that picture. I think this is actually from their video. Um, this is like, you know, the cheap way to get a dolly pretty much is to go ahead and make it yourself. It's probably not going to be as, uh, I don't know, it's definitely not going to be as effective as the ones that have been made professionally, but it is a way to still use a dolly or get the shots that you need if you can't afford the do the, a dolly or dolly track, because those can get it really expensive. So one way to do it yourself is you get those little washers, those little metal parts that you'll see right here on the board. You get some screws and you get some skateboard or skate wheels and you, you buy some skates or a skateboard and you just take the wheels off pretty much unless you can find a pack of just the wheels and then you take the that you put it all together get like a piece of plywood like this little square part and you use the screws and the the washer and the wheels you put them all together and put the screws through it and you make your own little dolly track then you can use, a, I think it's called PVC pipe, and you can just buy that from any hardware store, and it, it works like a dolly, and it, you can use it, set it up how you want, um, and you can create it yourself, and then you can put your camera on top of it. So that is a way to do it yourself if you are handy and you know what you're doing, or if you just want to test it out, see, and it's not too expensive. They made that one for about 50 bucks, and it still works really well. Um, especially if you have a flat surface that you're putting the dolly track on, it makes it really simple and easy to, to do something like this. Um, if you, again, if you're handy. So for a pre-built, more professional dolly, there's also a lot of different options. Some dollies, I think I actually have it in this picture. I think this one's the uh, Pro-Aim Quad 4 Pro. They have the wheels where you can roll it flat on surfaces. So if you look, you can see the wheels right here, right below um, the platform, there's this big wheels, kind of like little tires. And those are made so that you can actually move it across. If you have a flat surface, if you have something that doesn't have too many bumps and ridges in it, and it's not gonna bump the camera and make the movement look weird, but something kind of smooth, like maybe a, a gym or a dance floor or a theater stage or something like that, you can, use that to bring it across and have a 
hand, there's pretty much a cart where you're pulling it around and you have a dolly that you can move around and put wherever you want. So that is an option. And they also have those, <clears throat> what they call it, like skateboards, which just have the wheel, little wheels and that little, uh, little board to put the wheels on, the big tire wheels on top of that, on those, um, what are they called, the rail, wait, rail wheels. And those rail wheels will go on top of the, um, the uh, what is it called? Dolly track, <laughs> sorry. So they'll go on top of the dolly track and then you can have a dolly like that. So that one, it comes of course with like a seat and the camera and this part inside of the middle where you can attach something to it like that big arm so that you can have your camera stable on the thing. And then it has a lever on the back for someone to push or pull. Um, and then whoever the camera operator is would sit in that chair and hold the camera and move it around while they're doing it. I've also seen people put little cranes, little jibs on this thing. So it, it can do quite a lot, but it is, you know, it's going to be a lot more expensive. I think it's like, I don't know, $2,000 or something. Maybe it's less than that, but it's like one to 2000, I think. Um, and it doesn't work everywhere. Like if you have a bumpy street with a side like if you're going across a sidewalk with all the bumps it's not it's not really going to be like as smooth as you would get from actually having a pre-set up dolly track so it depends on where you're using it and it doesn't work everywhere but it is an option especially if you have the money and you have the space for it because it will take up a little bit of space using a something like that um, so some like, of course, some dollies like this one, they allow the camera operator to actually sit with it, sit with the camera itself. Some of the dollies will just have room enough for the camera, especially a lot of the do-it-yourself options. They'll just have room enough to put the camera on a tripod or a stand of some sort, and then the camera operator will be behind it, um, operating it, instead of on top of the platform with the camera itself. Whenever you're buying a dolly, always make sure to check the reviews and just check what the stability of it is, how smooth it is, um, and also how quiet it is. You don't want something that's really loud, that's making a lot of noise, um, you know, whatever kind of, whatever, however it's mechanically put together. You don't want all that stuff making noise, squeaking or making thuds or the wheels making scratch noises as they're going across the rail. You want it to be as quiet as possible, of course, because you always want to just capture as best sound as possible on set. And so uh, when using this, you look for ones that are more quiet. Also, of course, with this, with everything else, always check what the max weight is that the dolly can handle. Some dollies can handle two people with the camera, whole rig, maybe a whole jib arm and a whole crane or whatever, and like all that stuff and a whole rig pretty much on it without causing a problem and allowing people to walk around and move around without it affecting the camera. And some can only allow one person, some can allow nobody. So just look up what the max weight is and see what kind of stuff you need to put on there and uh, figure out if, if you, what kind of one you need to work for you. By the way, I think I have a picture of that rail wheel. So they look like that so that they go on that pole side by side, and then they just go across really smoothly. Some look like this, some look like uh, skates, sideways skates, some just look like that. Just depends on what kind you're getting. Stability is the biggest thing though to consider if you're wanting to attach a jib or a crane to your dolly. You need to make sure that thing's going to be stable and it can handle that because not all of them can, and it's going to come off the track possibly if it's not meant to to uh hold something like that so you just want to be sure that you check that out and be sure that it can handle whatever you're trying to do with it some but some dollies are basically just tripods with wheels and some come with interchangeable wheels so that you can switch them from being flat surfaces to the dolly track which aren't just like this but uh i can't i have a picture of it but pretty much it's just a tripod that has wheels on it and you can put it on the track 
and they just look like that. So you're basically just behind it, handling it. And some of them have a platform or some kind of thing where the people can stand or sit while, while on there. Some of them have enough room again for two people for like the director, cinematographer, or the camera operator, the cinematographer, whoever needs to be up on that platform. Um, and so you just want to, depending on what you want, what you need, just check out that kind of stuff. The platform or the chassis is the base of the dolly. It needs to be strong enough to hold whatever is put on top of it. The wheels can be either regular casters or tires, kind of like the ones you'll see on this, on the top part, the top wheels, the little tires pretty much. I think it's what they are. Um, and they're for those smooth surfaces like I was talking about. And then you have the rail wheels, which are for the track, which these ones come with little adjustable rail wheels, skateboard things where you can put it on. <clears throat> Mini dollies allow for extensions and accessories as well to be added quickly, safely, and stable enough to allow weight of the humans. So I don't know about this one, but I saw some that they were putting little side platforms on. Um, it was basically just like a little plank and you just quickly shove it into the dolly at the side and you screw it on and then the person can stand on it really quickly, really easily and safely and sturdy enough to hold that person without them making the whole track come off. So some of them come with that kind of stuff and you just wanna, if you do, you're not really gonna probably need that on an independent set, but if you need it, just know that there are options out there for that. But those ones are typically for when you need a bunch of people up there, you have that big, huge camera rig and you have those people and you have all the professionals that need to be near that area. So you need room enough for two to three people, um, but it's not always the case. The heavier dollies are usually the more stable. Again, heavier usually means more stable in a lot of this equipment. Um, just because it's more weight to hold it down. And like I said, the heavier ones also allow more movement. Like if someone's walking around the platform, if it's big enough, if they're taking a step to the side or they're doing one thing or another, um, then it won't affect the camera. It won't translate that movement into the camera itself. While the lighter ones, if somebody gets up or they move around while the camera things, while the uh, camera's moving, while the jib is moving, not jib, while the dolly's moving, um, it'll cause maybe some shake or some movement in the camera itself, and you don't really want that. So the ones that are more stable and heavy are usually better. Well, always better, but heavy doesn't necessarily mean it's going to be more stable, just most of the time. Some dollies come with a steering wheel and I didn't really find any pictures of that. So I don't know how, how many do, but some come with like a steering wheel instead of that lever, like you see in the back of this one right here, where the person's grabbing that and uh, either pushing or pulling it. Some of them come with a wheel where the person just uh, affects where it goes on the dolly itself. Good dollies have really smooth movement and handling so that they aren't jerky when they move. So with that handle, that lever for the good ones, it's not going to be really loose. It's going to be pretty, pretty much like a fluid head on a good tripod. You want it to be very fluid, but you want it to be give enough, uh, have enough give and take, give and pull to where uh, it's not going to jerk around the camera, jerk around the person, jerk around anything. You want everything to be really smooth and really um, fluid. And some dollies come with a hydraulic arm, <clears throat> kind of like this, and that gives it more ability for vertical movement so that it can go up and down. Of course, those are usually more expensive. Um, but it does give that ability to where it can move side to side on the track or roundabout on the track, however you have your track set up. And then you can also move the camera up and down on that platform or whatever you have attached to that platform. And then there's some dollies that are um, electric 
that allow remote control of the dolly. But of course, those can get a lot more expensive when they're not manually controlled. Um, but they do allow for like repeatable movement to continuously go back and copy movement over and over again. If that's something that's really needed. There are options out there for that. And then, uh, then there's, you know, there's ones like where you have the person, you have the whole camera rig and you have the hydraulic arm and everything. And then they could also be those um, electric ones where the person's on it, but it's electrically going back and forth instead of somebody pulling a lever. Does anyone have any questions or comments or anything to add for dollies? Um, let's see. Uh, yeah, so you had showed like the wheels and the skateboard wheels and stuff like that. Um, I'm going to say pretty much what I've been saying this whole time. You could pretty much build a lot of this stuff if you have the the time and the pay like i i bought a um i actually purchased a uh a plywood dolly and you know it had you know the skateboard wheels just like the ones you just showed and mm. and it was like well i could have i could have like i was just being I, I was just being lazy i didn't want it but i you could literally go to home depot and buy all the supplies to build the same exact thing um you know, it's just a supply wood. You put your your tripod on. It's convenient to have because okay. you know you you don't have to. You know, a lot of people get the um the the. Did you show the dolly legs? The dolly legs. There's one. There's one where it's like um it has the same skateboard wheels, but it's like uh three legs that attach to your tripod as as opposed to the to the plywood. And it's like those things are like 40 bucks or something. Yeah, that one like right this. there. Yeah. Yeah. Those, like you can buy those. They they attach to your tripod and um you could set them up on a rail system and, and all that stuff. Um I had one of those and it's just annoying because you have to attach it to your tripod. I think the plywood is more convenient because you can just put your tripod on top of it and you're you're ready to go. Mm -hmm. But you could build that. You could build a lot of this stuff, actually, if you just have the uh, the time and the patience for it. Of course, you know, then you have the, the more sophisticated ones with the chair and the seat. Some of them have um, some kind of shock, shock absorbers and stuff on them. There's this new thing I'm looking at now. It's um, similar to that, but it's like a um, it's got these 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 rubberized wheels and it has these little shock absorbers on there so you can do dolly shots um, in the grass and it like it, it absorbs all the you know the 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 grass and the, the bumps and stuff it absorbs all of it and oh, it has nice. like a little, yeah it's pretty cool I think I'll, I'll send it in the chat if it, if it pops up again but um yeah it, I'm not necessarily sure how that works I'm not a <laughs> I'm not a big fan of that idea <laughs> just <laughs> you know what I mean but um yeah it seems pretty it looks I, I like the idea you know they're they're getting more and more um creative and getting these smoother shots and you know making it more affordable and available to the you know to the consumer and to the lower budget people um but for me I you know I I have are you did you go over sliders yet or are you going to get into sliders uh, not yet. I actually couldn't get two sliders today, so we're going to go do that Thursday for the most part. I do have a few things I was going to mention, but um, oh, okay. yeah, sliders are basically like a dolly, but they are a bit more limited in what they can do. Yeah. Um, you have to ask yourself the question, because I have, I have the, the dolly set up, you know, with the PVC pipe or the, the, the metal pipe set up. And those things, you know, you can link them up and connect them and go as long as you want and build whatever tracks you want. But, you know, there's only so much, you know, you, you really got to think, do I really need this shot? You know, um, mm -hmm. me, like the biggest thing I, I just had, I just hated carrying it in my car. I, I, I'm the most um, compact gaffer, cinematographer, you know, because like, a lot of people they have like a, a van a utility van i just have my my little sedan 
So I had to try to figure out ways of compacting everything on there. And then um, I just got tired of, of carrying around the, the, the extensions and the pipes and the poles and stuff. Cause you know, I have to bring my back seat down and the pipes go all the way from the back of the trunk, all the way to the front of the car. So right. I just get, you know, I was just like, well, I, I rarely, I bring it on whatever shoot I feel is important. I bring it just in case I need it, but I got tired of doing that. So I said, you know, let me get a, I just got a slider. And like you had said, it's, it's, it's limited in its range, but you know, if you, if you wanted the option to be able to get that little bit of movement, like if you wanted to get a little bit of a, a, a tracking shot, you have that option. So I kind of sacrificed that. And, you know, if I, if I, cause you know, I, I thinking about it, I'm like, I really don't need that, that distance. I just really, I really never really came into a shot where I needed that much distance, um, you know, with the, uh, the traditional, the traditional dolly. Right. So I just went and got me a, uh, a slider instead. I mean, it's good to have both, but you know, it, you, it's one of those things where it's just like you have to ask your que- yourself the questions like, do I really need, what kind of shot am I going to get with that? Because there's only so much. Because you can't really do a, a head-on dolly shot because you're going to see the track. It has to be kind of like a sideways shot. And normally, naturally, people think, oh, the, the sideways shot, you're you're tracking people walking. But that's a lot of walking, you know, and a lot of people misconstrue that. I mean, the movies, the big Hollywood, they have like a whole like, train track that goes you know from what <laughs> they leave it, it was like for Kansas. Kansas. yeah so yeah. it looks like this it basically looks like train tracks for real yeah and if you're not willing to to do all of that and that takes a long time to set up as well so i don't know like for me i i just rather had rather just go ahead and get the dolly and there's and then you know there's other ways of of getting certain shots like that not perfect but um let's just say your character is on a sidewalk or something you could set a mount onto to the side of your car and follow them on your car as opposed to trying to go through all that trying to get all that motion on a track you know there's different ways of doing it you just kind of kind of have to ask yourself like you know what kind of shot am i going to need is it necessary one and two um like do I, you know, do I, do I want to go through that pain and trouble doing that? Or do I want to just, you know, maybe I shouldn't have such a long shot. Maybe I'll just go ahead and get a slider or do something else with it, you know? Yeah. But, yeah, definitely. And especially with like the bigger dollies, you definitely want to not do it if you don't have too much of a crew because it needs, you know, if you have that one that has the chair and it's going to go on these, uh, the track, then you're going to have somebody that has to, you're gonna have the dolly, the dolly grip that has to push or pull the dolly up through that lever. Um, let me go back to it. So that lever, and then you have the actual camera operator or cinematographer sitting up there um, with the camera itself. And then you have the, the grips who are having to put together the everything and um, you know the the different the tracks and setting up that the skateboards on it and putting the wheels up on it and making sure that everything's sturdy and stable. And then you have the camera crew putting a camera on top of it. So it does take a lot more time and you definitely need more people to handle it when you are doing something like that. But it does uh, end up paying off. If you do need those shots, like Brian was saying, there is sliders, but they are limited in the range that they can go. And the weight, a lot of them can't handle the same amount of weight that a more professional dolly can, but some of them are starting to be able to handle a bit more weight now. Um, so you can check that out. And we'll talk about sliders more on Thursday because I wasn't able to get to it when we were studying. To, so uh, we'll I'd talk like about to, that. Uh, I would okay. like to add is that uh, these tracks are pretty painful to um, you know align them. You got to put those pegs in. Mm-hmm. And uh, that takes a long time to uh, set it up. Um, you gotta have, you gotta have both the. Uh, okay. <laughs> what happened? <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> so, so yeah, so the alignment is a, a big, you know, that that takes about maybe like forty-five minutes if you want to do a quick shoot. Yeah. But I would think, um, you know, the. 
the scooty technology is coming off uh, hey, it's pretty pretty good and um, i don't know i think uh, it's not uh, that has not uh, come down to dollies right because easily it could be uh, with all the shock absorbers and you know what not <laughs> smoothness right. of these uh, scooties are pretty pretty amazing uh, you know you can i don't know how the balancing goes and all that but maybe there is like a four wheel kind of thing which would uh, help in that mm-hmm. respect because it seems yeah. like uh, there are scooties that are very better, you know? <laughs> yeah. Right. Yeah, and it's definitely getting better, especially with the more that they are making it for, you know, like cheaper budgets. They're making it for more budget ranges than just the top tier like they used to. So that's right. always and these, these scooties are even going, I was watching uh, somebody kind of uh, go in the mud road and they was pretty smooth, actually. It's not really having any issues with... Uh, bumping and all that you know uh, mm-hmm. which is also amazing nice. what uh, yeah and, but i don't know how you could uh, rig that into a dolly uh, that would be awesome yeah yeah definitely all places <laughs> another thing um to think about guys when you're talking about like these kinds of shots and smoothness is there is an option to stabilize footage in post-production it's not really um, you should want to get it as smooth as possible on set, but there are options, especially if you're shooting at a higher resolution to punch in a bit. And um, it can like, there's some automatic stabilization and then there's some where you have to like kind of manually mess with it a little bit, but you can change the framing around just a tiny bit to where the camera's not really looking like it's moving, even though it was when you were on set. So um, there is that option as well, if you don't get the perfect smoothness on set but try go always go for you know the best you can get on set because it's just going to be easier you don't have to rely on editing but there is that option if you need it um all right so going on from that we're going to talk about cranes so cranes first of all jibs and cranes are technically different they're used interchangeably a lot of the times but they do mean different things The crane is the arm that operates the boom or the jib. So if you look at this picture, that crane is going from that four-wheeled contraption all the way back to that guy over there. And this is a pretty big one. It's going all the way up. That crane is just the huge thing you'll see going all the way to the pretty much the edge. And then you have the jib that is where the camera is attached and that arm that is at the end of the crane. So the jib is where you have that movement and things like that. And the crane is the part where it's going to basically just extend outward in one direction. So that is something to remember when you're trying to buy one, because if you're going to buy a jib, they're going to be a lot smaller than a crane would be. So if, but you also want to make sure that you are getting a whole package if you are buying a crane make sure that it is either coming with that extended jib arm or that you know that it's not so that you can um, factor that into your budget and say, okay, well, this is this amount of money and the jib is this much money and this is compatible with that. So now I can put that thing together and the whole thing is gonna cost this much. Um, So just be sure you look out for that because they are technically different. And a lot of companies, especially for lower budget productions, will sell jibs because they are just the smaller, um, they are smaller things, the smaller things. They're not as big as cranes for the most part. So also look out for that. Uh, Even if you get a crane, different cranes are going to have different lengths and they can also, some of them can extend further. Some of them are set and you just put them together Um, and they're going to be set at that extended length. And some of them can um, have attachment, like have um, flips or switches or whatever you call it to where you can actually bring it down and um, retract it or extend it out further, depending on how big you need it. So that is one thing to look into if you are trying to buy a crane, just see if, if can it contract down at all or am I going to build it? And that's gonna be the length that has to stay the whole time. 
ones that can contract and expand will have a little bit more option in how far out it is and the um, how big it is whenever you are bringing it anywhere. You can compact, it's a little more compact. So that is another thing to consider anyway, is just how compact can it become? Even if I break it down in pieces, how compact is this thing going to be? Because um, cranes can, if, if you're using something like this on the picture, it's going to be quite big and you're going to probably need a big van um, to carry it around, usually, a, or a grip truck. So that's another thing to consider. You might, you probably want to need, you know, this big of a thing, especially for a lot of the things you want to use it for. You can get small ones. A lot, a lot are smaller. Like uh, I know some that are down to like three feet and then they extend out to, I don't know, probably way more than like 25 feet, something like that. I don't know. They extend really, really far, probably even further than that. I don't know. But, uh, they're all different sizes is what I'm trying to say. And so you don't have to get the biggest ones, especially if you're just trying to get like a top down shot, you don't really need it to be super high up for the most part, especially depending on the kind of lenses you're using and the kind of camera. So just think about all that whenever you're buying one. Um, one of the things you wanna consider is how fast it can be set up and how fast it can be broken down. Are you going to need a crew of three grips to set it up and take it down? Is it more of a one person thing that takes 20 minutes? Depending on the size you get, depending on the budget, depending on what it is um, aimed towards, like what budget and what kind of production it's aimed towards. Some are aimed more towards the high end professional budgets and the studios with all the different crew members. And some are aimed more towards a one man, one woman does it all kind of thing. So they will be more easy to set up and they will be um, easier to break down. But that comes at a con of being less stable and not being able to handle as much weight for the most part, probably all the time. But I mean, you might find one that, I don't know, there might be some middle ground there. One of the things you mainly wanna consider is how smooth the movements are. So this, how sturdy it is, how stable it is, is important with cranes because that's gonna determine how smooth it is. You don't want these movements to be jerky or ugly and janky. You want them to be very smooth, very fluid, just like with every other piece of equipment to make them look the most professional. If you're gonna go ahead and buy one of these to get it from that angle, then it's not, and if it's not gonna look good, then you know consider why are you buying it if it's not going to turn out looking really professional. If you make sure you just want it from that angle, you don't care if it's a little jerky, then that's fine. But just consider that and make sure that you look up the reviews, like with everything else, look up the reviews. Is this thing smooth? Does it take smooth shots? I'm sure YouTube has a people, a somebody reviewing it, showing what it looks like when you're using it, that kind of thing. On a lot of these different pieces of equipment, you can find that especially on the lower end and the more consumer end of things, you can see a bunch of different videos reviewing each and every piece of equipment out there. So that is something I always try to do whenever you are trying to buy something. Even if you think you're sure of one thing, just check it out, see if it's actually what you think it is whenever you see it being used in real life. Um, with cranes, you're going to need to counterbalance them with a different weight. Some of them will come with, with their own weights that you attach to the other end of the crane. So where that guy is far off in the picture, put the mask on over here, um, he might, he's on the end that has that counterbalance weight. And so sometimes with the smaller ones, you might just use a <clears throat> sandbag or something like that, or a few sandbags. But with the larger ones, they typically either have their own or you bring some kind of counterweight system to balance it out so that the camera isn't too heavy because that side is obviously gonna be the more heavy side because all the weight is extended out that way. You don't want your camera to be too, that side to be too heavy and then your camera just to go smash down in the ground when someone accidentally lets go or something. So you always wanna counterbalance it, make sure it's even or um, that there's not too much weight on that side compared to the other side. And that's what the counterbalance is for. 
Um, as with all the rest of the gear, depending on the kind you get, the payload or the weight capacity is what it can handle. So some are made, again, some are made for more heavier cinema camera setup loads, and some are made for smaller DSLR cameras, things like that. Let's see if I have a picture. There's one that's a little bit smaller. It's a little bit more for like a DSLR or something a little bit um, less, less big, less large, less heavy. As with this, when it's like very large, very complex, there's different metal beams coming out from everywhere. This one just has basically one or two that's sticking out, kind of like a fishing rod. So uh, depending on the one you get, it's going to depend on what kind of camera it can handle, what kind of weight it can handle. And you just want to look out for that. Make sure that your camera lays, weighs less than what it can handle and make sure that there's some buffer room, just like with everything else. You want to make sure it doesn't meet the maximum or it doesn't come close to the maximum weight that it can handle because you don't want to accidentally go over and then the whole thing snap in half and your camera fall to the ground and everything's busted. <clears throat> And also, um, and I already said this, be sure that like when you go higher up, higher end, it's more likely that the pieces are going to come separate, separately when you buy them. So just keep that in mind. That's pretty much with everything. Whenever there's two separate pieces, like with the C stand and the extended arm, when you go to the higher end of things, they typically sell them in pieces so that you can, um, if you have a favorite extended arm from a different brand or a different kind or whatever, you can buy it separately and you can put it together and customize your own piece of gear. So the higher up you go, they usually sell these pieces all separately. And you wanna make sure that uh, when you're buying them, they have everything that you need or you, that you know what you have, again, so that you know how much you need to pay. This one doesn't really have, this one I think actually is just a jib. Um, and that's why you can see the difference. This one, it's it's not really a crane, I don't believe, um, where it doesn't have a part at the end that connects to the camera, the whole thing does. Whereas this one that has that crane and then the jib connects to it and that's where the camera connects to the jib. So that's where you might buy a jib compared to a crane is whenever you have a cheaper budget, but then it doesn't have um, one, negative about buying these ones is like it doesn't have as much versatility with the camera it can't move around as much as the ones that have um like this camera can move 360 degrees it can move you know all, in all different directions it can point down up around whereas this one i think that might have to stay flat or it might be able to like do a little tilt but it looks like it's pretty limited and and how where the camera can move so that is something to consider if you're doing it you can obviously move the thing around to give it a panning so that you don't have to actually pan the camera but just with like the bigger more professionalized equipment if you're able to if you have the crew for it if you're on the budget all of that um, they just have more movement it can do where the camera itself can move and pan while you are panning the thing um, or it can, you know, do a tilt while you're panning, while or you can tilt while it's panning, and so different movement combinations that it can do to have different looks. Um, whereas these ones can do, they just have a little bit less versatility to them. Some cranes are mechanized where it's allowing for those automatic movements. Some jibs are as well. Even on a lower budget, you can sometimes get one that's maybe like a thousand. 1500 um, for like a smaller jib, but it's mechanized. I bought one from Edelcrown. It works pretty well, but it is really small. It's only like, I don't know, three feet or something. So it's not really that big. It's not really that long of a jib, um, but it is mechanized. So that is nice. And I can, you can set it up and have it repeat the same motion over and over again. So that is something and with the larger budgets and larger sets, they usually have some piece that's usually mechanized so that the person at the one end can press a button and that will tell the camera what to do and which way to face and all of that. So that the jib is working with the crane and then they're working the crane while they're 
working the mechanized part of the jib so that the jib's turning the camera around and tilting it and panning it and all that. And then there's some jibs, I mean, some cranes <clears throat> that have a platform up near the camera where the camera operator will actually sit. And, you know, those ones are obviously a lot more expensive. They are for the bigger budgets and you have to have a camera operator and there has to be a lot of counterweight to it but that allows for the camera operator to be up with the camera while there's somebody operating the crane. So it gives it a little more versatility and a little more uh, options for like manually controlling everything to how you'd like. Um, this is from Cobra Crane and it's just some of the different jibs that you might find. If you are just going to buy a jib, one of the cheaper options instead of a crane itself, because those are those can be expensive. Simple action, regular jibs, general use, two bars. It's kind of like the picture we saw. One on the top of the other with two parallel, but pivot a bull mount points so it can just go up and down. So the crane booms, the camera can be stay pointed at the subject throughout the arc of the boom. So it maintains its framing so it looks straight ahead and then it just keeps looking at this same um, area straight ahead <clears throat> instead of like the camera tilting or something like that. If you can move the bar up and down um, or the bottom bar back, you can also tilt the camera. Oh, so it does have the tilting. Um, if you move one of the bars over the other, it'll actually tilt the pole, letting the camera tilt. So you can also tilt and um, let the camera look up or down while raising or lowering the crane or the, the jib. And they say the crane does tend to move when tilted. But, uh, general, these ones are usually the most inexpensive. They're made from either aluminum or carbon fiber tubes with aluminum mounts and pivots. So those are probably like the cheapest ones you'll find. It's just something pretty simple. Um, you don't really have as much control, but it does it, it does have the uh, tilt. You can make the camera tilt, I mean, up and down, which is cool. Then there's remote head cranes. Um, they are cranes that require a remote pan and head, tilt head to provide camera movement functions at the camera end of the crane. While swing and boom are still done at the operator level, these cranes are usually quite heavy duty and considerably more costly than others as the pan and tilt head add in most cases are more expensive than the crane itself. And they give some brands, Jimmy Jibs, Euro Cranes, and Porta Jibs are examples like that. So that would give you that ability to uh, mechanically move the, head, the camera, tilt it or pan the camera itself while you are manually moving the crane around, but they're gonna be more expensive than the other version. And then there's something called cable assist cranes. Um, they give some brands, Veravon, Hodge, and Cobra Crane. They rely on fluid head to dampen the tilting and panning of the crane, thus allowing them to benefit from the variable fluid drag on both the pan and tilt. This provides for smooth, dramatic moves with little effort. In many cases, the cable also provides the ability to control the camera tilt independently of the boom as well as provide a method for keeping the camera pointed at the subject throughout the arc of the boom. Like all the other cranes, these cranes require remote control for monitoring and camera control at the operator's standing position. Generally, these cranes are the most cost-effective to buy and less expensive overall. So, all right, so they can all do some kind of camera movement tilting, but with the remote head cranes, you'll have panning and tilting at the camera where you will be able to also move the crane. And the cable assist cranes, you'll pull on the cable to let it move up and down. And um, again, some of these sound like they're probably more or less quick or jerky than the other ones. So you also want to make sure you're trying to get something smooth. You want smooth motion. You want smooth movement so that it's not going to look cheap because that's the least thing you want when you're buying something like this. Um, some of the brands you'll find for cranes are Pro-Am, Benro, Hydroscope, Cam Gear, Pro-Aim, which is actually a different brand. I thought it was the same one when I first saw it, but Pro-Aim and Pro-Am are different. 
Newer or Newer, however you say that, and Orion. So those are some of the brands of cranes you'll find if you're looking out for one, some of the cheaper ones, some of the more expensive ones. Those are some of the main ones out there. Does anyone have any questions or comments or things to add for that? I have a, I think I have a 12 foot jib and um, it comes in sections. You have the option to go four, eight, and then 12 and um, I like it. I I love it. Um, my my only my biggest uh, issue with it is like the ones you just showed. Um, in in mine, um, it's like they're they're mainly designed for lighter cameras and, and DSLRs, which is a problem because, as I mentioned in a in a lot of meetings that. You know, we are transitioning, we transitioned into the DSLR phase and now we're transitioning into the, um, the cinema camera phase, which those cameras are, some of them like the Black Magic is, the Black Magic isn't that much bigger than a, a standard DSLR, but you know, once you, um, and a red, a red isn't really that big either, but like once you put all the, you know, the monitor and the, the, um, the battery and all that all the other accessories on there you're, you're talking about a, a camera that's like a good 20 30 pounds mm -hmm. and then then you have the jib itself which is about a good 20 30 pounds and then you want the counterweights so that stuff can get pretty heavy and finding a good stand to, to hold all that it's it's i <laughs> so these these jibs that you're seeing are really meant for like a, a bare bone DSLR. Um, I'm I can like with my jib now. I can get away with. I'm using. I I can put my Black Magic on there, but I, it's not ideal. So I I you know I have you know my uh, my Fuji film which I can put on there as well. And I usually I usually put that on there on top, but I'm kind of just pushing it like just pushing it like pushing it to the to the, the to the maximum. Whenever I put my camera on that thing, because no, it's not yeah, more indie film ones are definitely going to be for like smaller cameras. And if you want the camera with all the bells and whistles, you're gonna have to invest at some point on something a little sturdier. Yeah, most definitely. Yeah, and then you have to ask yourself the question, um, because like I said before, you know, do you need the shot, and do you even want the shot? Is it necessary? And for me, like I definitely for this particular topic, when you're talking about jibs, dollies, on the other hand, are different because like everybody's accomplishing that shot some kind of way. Um, you'll see that a lot in in more lower end films. But things that are missing that you won't really see too much in um because this is what I this is what I go through when I think about um shot wise, the things I always consider is like is everybody else doing it? Not necessarily Hollywood, but like, you know, people on my level, my peers, are they doing shots, certain shots? And um, I noticed that you rarely, you, you'll rarely see um, any crane or jib shots in, in low budget film. You'll see it in Hollywood because of course they have the budget to do it, but lower budget films, like you really don't see it. So anytime I get to use my jib, I'm always on it because I know that's going to make me stand out a little bit more, even though like, you know, it, it may take some time to, to set everything up. But at the end of the day, I know I'm going to get a shot that you're not going to see in um, other, you know, small production films. So I think yeah. this is this is something that's this is something that I definitely um, think will definitely benefit you a little bit. Even if it's just like a, a small, subtle, you know, coming down, you know, it makes all the difference and it will make you stand out a lot more. Um, and you don't, you don't see it in music videos anymore, but th this was like very big in like 90s music videos. They, they always had like the, um, the crane shots and stuff like that. You'll still see a lot of crane shots in Hollywood. Uh, people kind of get them mixed up with, with dr now we have drone shots and people are trying to incorporate that because... That's another thing. Um, I don't suggest using a, dr a drone to try to establish a shot like that. 
I, if you're just going to go, because there's a big difference between um, getting an aerial shot and an actual an actual jib shot. So mm -hmm. there is a big difference. Um, but yeah, it's 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 just different. I don't know. I, I can't explain it, but it's just a look and a feel that kind of just makes you stand out a lot more than look more professional because people look at it and see, oh, that's a complex shot. It's yeah, exactly. As, so. Yeah. Makes sense. So I definitely I definitely of all the gear, like it's something I definitely recommend uh getting. It's not too many people not too many low budget or amateur filmmakers go for the jib shot. Not too many. Not only that, but also it all it also proficient you a lot in other ways too. Because you know, once you learn how to use it correctly, you can get all, all uh, other types of shots like um certain bird's eye view shots from the ceiling. Um, you know, people kind of scratch their heads trying to get shots, you know, when they do the shot pointing down in the bedroom and you know, he's laying down on the bed and they're doing it with the cameras up. Most people would just stand like, no, I just, me, I stand, I hook my jib up for that. But most people would just go and put a tripod on the bed and try to shoot downwards. It's not the best, but um, <laughs> yeah, there's, there's other ways. The, jibs, the jib is good for a lot more than just those shots. It is, it's helped me out a lot. So I definitely recommend getting a, uh, a jib. Nice. Yeah, that's the piece of equipment. I, I still, like I said, I have my mechanized one, but it's like only three feet. So I don't really count it as uh, <laughs> if I was trying to get like a top down, it wouldn't really work for that. So it's mainly just for like the little jib up or down movement, but it's not really for like a top down. And so I want to get like a larger one, um, something mm -hmm. like that top right or I don't know, something maybe more expensive than that. But but yeah, that is a, um, they, those types of shots, they definitely do look very different than a drone shot. You can tell the difference. Um, drone shots typically aren't, they're not usually as smooth and they're not usually, they don't usually do as much movement like with tilting while going up or down and having that vertical movement while tilting or things or panning while tilting while doing that vertical move. Um, Do, uh, the drones don't really do can't really do as much of that at once as you can get with a drone I mean with a crane and with a crane you have more manual control which um, you know can add that little bit of like human human movement to it instead of having just a up down view of like what you would get with a drone going up and down straight so it is a, it is a bit different and it is less smooth whenever you're using something like that so it is a, definitely a good piece of gear to have and it ups the quality of uh whatever it's in for the most part if used right and not used too much like with anything if you're using it way too much um it's going to start getting annoying in the the project so that's something to also consider even if you have the piece of gear you don't want to overuse it to the point where it's just like another sliding shot another i have shot. that in the indie scene when it comes to overuse of fog it's just it drives me crazy i'm like oh oh with so everything having haze. <laughs> yeah the super <laughs> hazy shots i'm like they're not when they don't have a necessity and they're just trying to make it look cool it just makes me want to sigh a little bit. Like, huh. All right, so the next thing we're going to talk about is car mounts. Some car mounts um, are uh, way more sturdy than others. So you have some like this one that are made more for like DSLRs and things like that that can attach to the side of a car with some suction cups and some um, different little poles that extend outward and have a little platform for you to put your camera. But you always, this one is the most important to check. Well, I don't know if it's the most important, but it's definitely important to check the weight. Um, because if you're moving your car around, you don't want that to fall off or to break and snap in half and for the camera to fall. The heavier your camera, the more expensive it probably is. And you don't want to put it on something that can't handle it, especially if you're going to go outside and drive it around. So you want to be extra careful, make sure that these things, you look at the payload or the, the weight capacity, whatever they call it, it's going to be how much weight it can handle 
and make sure that you are under that. Don't just check what your body, the camera of your body, camera of your body, the body of your camera weighs. You also want to think about when you attach the lenses, the attachments, everything like that, like Brian was saying. When you attach those extra things to it, they add weight. If you're adding a handle, if you're adding a monitor, if you're adding a lens, all of those have their own weight. You need to add those all up and you need to figure out your actual weight of all your gear that you're going to have on that system and make sure that it is under that payload, under that max weight. But uh, so some of these, there are actual like, there are some lower end ones that just have one suction cup and that suction cup holds the camera. Um, those you typically wouldn't put on the side of the car. You might just put it on like the hood to look into the window, the, the uh, windshield. So there are those, you just wanna be careful. You all, again, make sure that those can handle the weight of whatever camera you're using with all of its gear and all of its attachments. And then there's ones that are a little bit more heavy duty like this that can go on the side of the car. There's some that can go on the front, on the hood. Um, that have like larger suction cups and have a little bit more of a stability. There's, um, there's, this is like a rigged up thing. This is where you want all these clamps to come into play and where you have all these straps and really, you really want to have some people who know what they're doing with grip um, so that they're not going to damage this car. They're not going to damage these cameras. None of this stuff's going to fall and break apart. All of it's gonna be stable and work for whatever shot you're going for. This is the kind of thing where grips really come in handy when they know what they're doing because they can set up these really uh, difficult to set up like uh, contraptions pretty much. These little, these, uh, they set these all up. They make sure it's all tight, secure, safe, and that it's not gonna go anywhere, that the car is not gonna get bent in. Um, nothing's going to start damaging the headlights or the hood and crushing it down. Everything's going to be secure, but it's not going to be weighing too much on the car itself because it's putting more weight on those side rails, on those side poles that are coming off the side of the car. Because uh, I think it's like suction cups or plates that's attached, and then they have a strap going around that, and then the poles coming up off that from both angles, and then they have the um, the dolly track pretty much, or maybe they're gonna just stabilize that and have it in one area. But then they have the little poles coming out of there where you might have like those extended arms from a C stand coming out there and attaching to both those cameras. So yeah, it's a lot and there's a lot going on. And so the, the higher up you go, you're gonna see these more crazy rigging systems that go all over the car. I wouldn't recommend just doing this on your own unless you are okay with damaging your car or you're okay with damaging your camera. If you mess up something and it doesn't work out and it falls apart, if you're okay with that, sure, go ahead. But um, I wouldn't recommend this unless you actually know what you're doing. So, but there are systems that come that um, you can put together yourself. Let me go back. So there are systems you can put together yourself that um, don't require all of this all of these, uh, this uh, crazy rigging to, to happen. And that's something more just like this. That's already a pre-made system. You just use the suction cups, you follow the instructions, you make sure that it's doing what it needs to do and that it's secure, and then you put your camera on it. Um, so with those suction cups, if you can look in the picture, there's that little white button. And that's the thing that you're gonna like press in whenever you're putting the suction cup to the car, whether it's on the side or whether it's on the hood, you're going to <clears throat> press that in until it gets, um, yeah, basically it's going to tell you how good of a suction you have on that surface. And most of them will have like a red ring around part of it. And that'll tell you like this part needs to not be showing. And then if it's not showing, that means you have a good suction here if that thing pops out and all of a sudden there's that red ring showing, it means that suction is not good. Um, it's a little more loose than you would like it to be. And you need to make sure to do something about it before all of the rest of them happen like that. And then the whole thing falls off because it came loose. So always make sure that whenever you're putting this thing up, you're setting it up, 
whatever indicator it has to show you that you don't have good suction, make sure that you move it around or mess with it until you get that good suction so that it's all um, not going to come loose and fall off. Um, there's these other mounts that um, have suction cups and actually it is basically like this. I think it's the same thing, but they're called, um, you can call them a hostess tray or, a, or I think it's Brayer or Brower, um, where it has that little tray and it goes and you suction it to the side of the car and then it has those little poles that go up and then it has that little, a little tray where you put the camera like this. And those can sometimes handle really big cameras. Sometimes they can only handle small ones. It just depends on the kind you get, but they typically go off the side of the car where the window would be um, like this. And they attach either like that with the suction or more they extend out like the one we saw just a second ago. Where was it? Oh, I can't find it. Well, anyway. So they'll, they'll have different contraptions and I'll tell you what the max load is and what you're able to do with it. But pretty much it's just to get that side view of a car driving. So then you can just literally have somebody drive while they, while you have the camera there and uh, you'll see the side profile that you see in a lot of movies and a lot of uh, TV shows and things like that. On a larger set, you might have an actual car specialist that does the rigging for these cars, but on smaller sets, it falls to the grip department. So just make sure your grips know what they're doing before you just set them up to go ahead and do these car shots. If they don't know, if they've never done that, um, get somebody who knows what they, who's done it before, just so they're doing it right, they're doing it safe. Yeah, because if it doesn't work out, you can't blame them. You're the one that let them do it. Yeah. For the simplest setups, it can take, these things take a lot of time is uh, one thing though. For the simplest setups, they say it can take multiple hours. And for the more complicated ones, it can take like half a day, even for people who know what they're doing. So um, you want to make sure you schedule in that time and you give your grip crew enough time to prepare that rigging and make sure that you try to pre-rig it Get it done before you need it. That way, when you're on set, when you're doing it, when you're shooting, you're ready to go and everybody's not sitting around waiting on the uh, rig to get complete because you'll be waiting around for quite a while. There's also what's called these um, process trailers. And that is where you actually put the car on a trailer itself and it's made for filmmaking and you can have another platform where you have the camera, camera crew, tripods, whatever else, lighting, and it's filming the car. And uh, what it does is there's actually the trailer, whoever's driving the trailer is the one that's making the movement. So the actual actor doesn't have to drive or there's not a green screen behind the car making it look like it's driving or a projector or whatever they use on those um, cheaper budgets to make it look like the car's moving when really it's stationary. This, you can actually move the car around. It looks like the car is moving itself, but really the person's not actually driving. So it's a bit safer um, and it's, uh, it's a bit stable and it has a lot more room and space for the crew and the camera and um, lighting and all of that to fit as well as the car. So there are those, I'm not sure exactly how much they are, but according to, um, what is it? No Film School, the website, they said that they're actually cheaper than what you would might maybe imagine. So um, smaller budgets can actually rent these out for the most part and get them. And uh, it's, it's a lot better than trying to have your actor drive around. But if you don't have the budget for it, then you have to find other ways around it with those other kinds of car mounts and things like that. But this is some a way to where you really don't even need the car mounts because there's another platform where you can set up all of the gear and record it that way. Um, another thing you might see 
is um, a separate car that actually has the mounted camera rig on it that's filming the production car. So what we were seeing before, like with these pictures, is uh, that's if you're filming the character, you're filming the actor that's in, you know, in frame. Um, and it's attached to the car of that actor. But there are multiple times where they will just have a another car that has the whole rigging and a jib or a crane coming off of it that um, is shooting the production car so that they can see it from all angles and they can move the camera around freely. Um, so that is another thing that they do, but that's typically on larger sets or on more professional uh, productions. And that's typically when they, you know, block off the whole street or block off the whole block so that they can uh, do whatever they need to do for their film. Um. They say that you should always attach those, um, if you are doing something a little more complicated, always attach those ratchet style safety straps, like you see this red strap right here. That just adds another element of safety. If you've ever pulled a trailer or if you've ever brought something in the back of your trunk, whenever your trunk can't close because the thing's too big, you'll know that they say to just use these to lock it down in place and to give it some extra safety so that it doesn't fall out. Same thing with this kind of thing. You don't want it to fall over. You don't want it to fall off. So these straps will help give it an extra buffer of safety and an extra bit of uh, security so that it uh, stays stable and stays on the car. And then lastly, there are these like hood mounted mechanical arm mounts that extend out a crane to capture the shots, but you'll typically only come across those on the larger sets, like I was saying. Um, I don't know if I have a picture of that. No, I don't. Let me see. It's going to be a Porsche. What? I said it's going to be a Porsche. I don't know why, but usually when they do that, it's always like a luxury car for some reason. Or an Audi. There it is. <laughs> <laughs> the guy was showing on his Alexis. Yeah, I have no idea why. Like, they can't just get a, a Ford Explorer or something. <laughs> or something. Yeah, it's just a big school car, man. Like, I mean, yeah, there's you know, also these, like, more, you know, these big ones that go on top of the hood, and then you have the, the crane extend out, and you have the camera and all of that. But again, that's only seen more on, like... They need it to be a car, that way they can they get can it. Go, they can the get more and more crazy and they need a car that can handle that weight and that can handle that extra uh th that weight going off to the side otherwise it's just going to you can have the car tip over and also a luxury car so they can get a deal with a car company hey we'll use the car in our demonstration give us a <laughs> did some research and i was looking for it i was looking up some of these cars and i was like trying to figure out like what was included in these cars that made them want to rig something up like that. And there's nothing, there's nothing in the specs. Everything you see on these cars are just, you know, uh, power steering, you know, just the, the normal stuff you would see in a, in a, in a car like that. Like there's yeah. nothing. <laughs> so much stronger, they wouldn't be able to use them on regular cars than they do. And also like, There'd be, a, I don't know, I feel like, like the whole luxury car thing is either comfort or like specific engines and stuff like that. I don't think there's that much of a difference in car in this, but I could be wrong. I don't know much about cars. That's what I'm saying. Like, you would imagine that they would rig something up like on an F 1 fit, a truck, a pickup truck. That makes sense. If you would put that crane. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Damaging the, the yeah. 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 I'm, they're like made so that they don't damage the car as, as best as possible and they take all the precautions necessary to make them that way but it's just kind of crazy that your car can handle that or a car can handle that not every car can handle this not every car i still can. think i still think it's free promo that's where i stand on it 
either way, there are these, um, but typically you're not going to be able to just buy this and set it up yourself. You're going to need a crew that know what they're doing and you're most likely not going to buy this thing. You're going to rent it out because, or you're going to rent it um, because you're not, it's not going to In be other words, for any time. filmmaker, is it really worth it unless you know someone who really knows their stuff? When it comes to this, because if you damage that rented property. Right, yeah. yeah. So it was something that's a little more small, like a little smaller and like a suction cup that can do a camera and you have the little straps. That's something that's doable to get that. Um, yeah, maybe put it shot. on the car, put it on the suction cup, put it on the car and instead of driving, just like push the car a little bit there. We got the shot without damaging the car. We're good. No, it's because real. if you're shooting through the windshield, you're going to see out the back and you're going to see the people pushing it. Ah, I know. I'm just saying, like, it's scary. Like, even the guys at the demonstration, I was freaking out because I was like, oh my gosh, he's open. He slammed the door so hard. I was like, <gasps> like, I well, again, if you're looking at the weight of these things and what they can handle, then you just, um, you know, also, if you're buying a new piece of equipment, check the warranty and check wh what it covers. Some of these might cover if your camera falls off, if you did everything right, who knows? Um, so you always want to check that out. And but see then again, how do you prove that? that? How do you prove that you did everything right? But this is also why if you're ever doing shots like this, you want to get that production insurance to cover your equipment. It might be more expensive, especially yeah. because you're doing these kinds of things and there is more of a risk of the stuff falling off or the stuff getting damaged. But uh, it's probably worth it in case it does happen, especially if you're using like this gear setup where you have an Ari, then uh, that's a super expensive camera. And whether you're renting it, well, you can't really rent any gear without getting insurance here's anyway. My, here's my but if you're using your own and you're trying to use it, then you're going to want that production insurance if you have expensive equipment. If you're renting okay, it, you're going to have to get your production insurance. And here's my thing. If, you if you're renting it, Obviously, you're going to need the production insurance and all that. But also, while you're setting it up, make sure to record or have the camera, like another camera rolling while you set it up to prove we did everything right. Because even if you do have the production insurance, there, there are some that might look at it and be like, well, there's no way of proving you did everything right. So well, we production insurance covers gear damage, no matter how it happened. Unless it's specifically in their contract that, like, if you damage well, it, you don't get it. But that's what it's in, for. Well, they still have to look into it, though. So it would help if you had, like, actual proof and, you know, speed up the process type of thing. Sure. If you have the time and you think about that kind of thing, go ahead and do it. But I don't think that's just that. I would think about it. <laughs> yeah, like, like I said, if you think about it, if you have somebody that's doing that, sure. But on a production set, you know, there's a lot going on. Get the so. behind the scenes guy. Hey, behind the scenes guy. Record us mounting this thing just in case it goes to crap, you know? I right. don't know. This is just. And then you find the out that they got they, the grip hooked it up incorrectly and now you pay for it all. <laughs> well, that's not the issue. Because you thought you hooked it up correctly. It right. <laughs> if you do it right. You're like, look at this. We hooked it up correctly. It came off. And they're like, no. If you, you bring it right. Suction cup on right. It's like, if oh. they ask for proof, you bring the footage. <laughs> If not, leave it alone. I'm just saying. I'm just I'm saying. Kidding. I'm kidding. I don't know. I'd be so scared. I'd want to have proof of everything. But then, like I said, when it comes to stuff like that, borrowing other stuff, the mount, I, I would feel more comfortable if I knew someone who maybe if I had a specialist, I'd be like, okay, I don't need to freak out as much. It's just because I was watching it. I was like, oh, that looks terrifying. And like it could fall at any moment. Yeah, but these things are made for this specific thing. It's not like you're just hooking up some random thing to the car and saying, yeah, now I have a car rig. These car rigs that you buy, these car mounts, they are made specifically for this. Nobody would buy them if they didn't work. Of course, you want to research research it, but um, you know, and, and make sure that the weight is good and the weight underneath it. But if it is, then there shouldn't be a problem because these companies wouldn't be able to sell this stuff if they're not working. If, if the and stuff I would assume doesn't work. they wouldn't oh, be sorry. able to sell this stuff to regular cars if they didn't work on regular cars either. So it doesn't have to be a, Le a Lexus or. Uh, oh, no, or, like this kind of cheaper stuff. It's always just for any car at all. But you want to make sure that, you know, don't try to pull it off while it has the suction because then you could tear off a part of your car. So your car doors aren't really that durable if you. Uh, 
ever been in a crash, they they get in a they get dented very easily. Yeah. Anyway. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's something to look out for if you're ever going to do a car scene. These are the best ways to go around getting those nice shots and still keeping that quality um, without without being limited in what you can do. So there's some, some, something to look out for, especially if you're going to have a crew that knows what they're doing and have done it before, looking at the rental costs or if you want to buy it, how much it costs to buy it and that kind of thing. Last thing I was going to talk about, I wasn't able to get into all of the uh, resources with this and study it, so I'm not sure about everything, but sliders, we were talking about them just a second ago. We'll go into more detail with them on Thursday when I research them all the way, and then, uh, and then um, anything new that's, that I learn or that's brought up that I forgot to mention, I will mention then, but basically they're just like a tiny dolly. You know, they're a the little track. They have different tracks and they are made out of different materials. Some are made out of carbon fiber. Some are made out of steel. Some are made out of aluminum. Actually, I don't know if any are made out of steel, but I know them. they're made out of aluminum and carbon fiber. And there's probably other options. I think some are actually made out of really hard plastic, but those, those are probably on the very cheaper end where they can start to bend and start to get a little, um, like they're cheaper for a reason. So again, as with every other piece of equipment, just make sure you know what the load is, you know, like what can it handle? What can it do? This one on screen, he has a red camera and he has that nice big um, mounting, uh, whatever you call it. I can't think of the word, but you know what I'm talking about. The thing that goes on the slide that's mounting onto it and that's the camera's mounted on that. Um, it is pretty big, it looks pretty heavy. so. Obviously it can handle that. He has two tripods on each end can, that's holding that up, giving it a little more stability. Whenever you have a slider, you either put two tripods on both ends. Some of them actually don't allow that. They don't have the holes necessary to, to do that. And they only allow you to put it in the middle like this. Now this one actually, I think it has those holes at the end where you could put two tripods. They just have it set up like this. Um, but some sliders that you get are only going to allow you to do the middle section. Um, and it is just a little less stable because once you bring the camera over to the each edge, it starts to lean and it starts to get a little more unstable. So you want to make sure you put those sandbags on these tripods that you're using, whether you have two or one, put the sandbags on, make sure it has the most weight and stability it can, because once that camera, especially depending on how heavy it is, once it gets to the other end or one end or the other, um, it'll be the least stable that it can be at that moment um, until you bring it back to the middle where it'll be the most stable. So one of the things you wanna think about and look, look for when you're talking about sliders is the same thing you wanna look for when you're talking about dollies. How smooth are they? Do they make a lot of noise? I know that my slider, when it gets to the middle, <laughs> one I had, I bought a new one from newer, but, and it works pretty well, but the, uh, the other one I had from Edelkron, I bought, it was a me mechanized one. Every time it gets to the middle, it hits the wheels of the, the middle part. And so it like comes, like does a little uh, bump every time it gets to the middle. And so it's not really that smooth, kind of crappy when it gets to the middle. I bought it used, so it could just be the person didn't take care of it. So it's not a really a bash on Edelkron. It's just my experience with that one piece of gear I got, but I bought it used, of course, so who knows. Um, but with the, with the other sliders, you just wanna make sure that they are smooth, that they aren't gonna have that kind of problem when it gets to the middle or the end or the edges. How stable is it? How much weight can it handle? You don't want it to have too much weight on it, especially on something like this where you're using one tripod because it could bend the poles or the um, where the slider is, or it could bend the or it could maybe snap in half, depending on how, how heavy the, the gear is. So that's something you want to think about. If you look at this, it also has those little tiny legs at the ends of the slider. So you can actually take it off that tripod if you want a really low shot, or if you want to put it on like a table or maybe some Apple boxes or something like that, you can, and it'll have that stable platform. 
Some of those I have seen, they aren't the best. They aren't really the most stable. Some of them kind of bend on each other um, with more weight. And so then they kind of fall flat. Some of them lock into place really well and they stay really sturdy. So that's just uh, something you want to look into. If you do want to get those really low shots or something like that, and you want to do a slider across the ground, then uh, you want to make sure that those little legs are going to be good for it because you don't want to buy it and then realize that they're not going to work the way you thought they might. Um, the, let me see. Well, the other thing is just like the materials that's made out of carbon fiber is obviously going to be lighter, which means it's going to be easier to carry around, but it's also, and it's still sturdy. Carbon fiber is known to be strong. So it won't be, as heavy as aluminum or something else, but it'll still give you that same sturdiness. I think from my experience, it is a little bit less stable. It is a little more, it bends, it has a little more give, um, but not too much to where you'll uh, notice a drastic um, difference. The best ones I would say, and the best way to set it up is always to have two tripods on each end if you can. So I would always, recommend going for one that has that can attach to two tripods or two light stands to each end that way it just has the most stability um, and that way it's not relying on the middle to hold the whole thing up like it is in this picture right here some of these like the edelkron one i was talking about do are are uh, mechanized where you can have a battery and it um, moves it um, automatically, you can set it up to do the same movement. There's other brands out there that do the same thing. Um, and some of them are manual, like the one he's holding. I actually, I'm not sure about this one, but I know for sure this one is manual where you're going to have to actually manually move the camera yourself. So if you really want to make sure that the camera is doing the same movement for the entire shot, uh, mechanize is the better way to go just because it's going to automatically adjust the camera based on the timing you said for it to start here and the timing you said for it to end there and it'll automatically move it the same speed throughout unless you tell it to go faster at a certain part whereas there's a uh, room for a little bit more human error whenever you are doing a um, manual slider but of course the manual ones don't need batteries so that's always a plus because having extra batteries and needing you're going to not just want one, you're going to want one or two or three, making sure that you have some extras so that if it runs out, you can put another one in and keep going so you don't ruin your whole production day. With the manual ones, you can just keep going no matter what. So uh, manual wins in that, but um, it just depends on what you want and what you want out of it. Pretty much they're going to do the same thing. They're going to be like a dolly shot. You can put them front to back and have a little bit of a, a forward or a backward movement, a dolly in or a dolly out. Or you can put them side to side like he's doing and have a tracking or a trucking shot, following your subject just a little bit or just going around them or revealing something on the other side of their head. Or a lot of people will use these to start out behind a post or something and then they will reveal the scene by simply sliding it to the left. So they're a lot quicker to set up than dollies. You don't have to set up this track separately and you don't have to have this huge contraption that you're putting together. And then you don't have to have as many crew members handle it. You can have one person or two people put this whole setup together. Especially if you're just using it on the ground, you can just do it with one person. They just grab, the, grab it out, put it on the ground and then put the camera on it and boom, now they can uh, control it. If you have a, uh, if you want to move really quickly and efficiently, then you want to have probably like your first or your second AC help out the camera operator or the cinematographer. And they all just kind of really quickly set this up where they have like the two tripods, the slider, and then the camera, and then boom, they're ready to go. Um, but, or, you know, you have grips and things like that to help out as well. But um, these are just typically a lot faster than, than dolly tracks. Dolly tracks take a while. And like, like uh, Vish was saying, like Brian was saying, they take a lot of uh, concentration and they to make sure that they get it right when this is just pre-set up. The limitations come in to where you can't curve the sliding at all. You, it's going to be straight. 
it's going to either be straightforward or straight. You can put it at a diagonal angle maybe, but it's not going to have that curve that you can get whenever you do a dolly track. Dolly tracks, you can set it up like a train pretty much, and you can do it any kind of, you can make S's, you can make circles, you can do it straight. You can make it look like a little tiny uh, roller coaster, having it go up and down in little bumps. That's what you can do with dolly tracks compared to sliders. Sliders are going to be straight and they're going to be just um, two dimensional or, I mean, I guess a little bit three dimensional if you're going front to back, but it's really just going to be in those, those uh, single fluid movements. Um, can't really think of anything else. Brian or Vish or anyone, you guys have anything to add to? two sliders if, i mean um, we'll get more in thursday whatever i forgot to mention but. not sliders but i'd like to go back to the the car mounting shots um i keep bringing this up but <laughs> you, you have to, like i said you got you have to ask yourself the question do i need this shot do i want this shot um the car mounts just like i said with the jib they make all the difference because like i said a lot of amateur film, you'll see like they'll do the uh, the camera on the passenger side seat or the uh, behind the driver, behind the passenger shot, you know. But if you have a nice, you know, setup outside the car looking in, that kind of adds a lot of production value to your shot. But I am with Priscilla. I do not trust those suction cups, not one bit. I don't <laughs> all i don't care how much money you spent on them i don't care how you. <laughs> don't trust it so they don't look very sturdy i'm sorry like it just feels like I'm a I but um yeah so for me like yeah. i've actually risked my black magic i've actually set it up but i did have to take it apart like take all the battery and everything off you know, just make it as light as possible just to eliminate, you know, them hitting the bump and it goes flying all over the place. Um, <laughs> yeah. you also have, I also have a secondary DSLR, which I feel more comfortable putting that on there than I do my actual black magic. So it's just, it's just a good thing about finding a good, you could find a really good B cam to match your A cam. And for shots like that, where you're risking the, the stability and the you know the safety of your camera you could just go with the b cam and put that on there instead so you don't feel as bad even though you know it's a camera you still spend money on it but it's just like you won't feel as bad and you won't have to stop production if it's your you know your main camera that happens to take the spill you know if you put a b camera on there um i have i do have the suction mounts but i also have um one that's magnetic so it's four little magnetic uh, plates that st stick to your car. I feel a lot more comfortable with those as opposed to the um, the suction cups. <laughs> if I use the suction cups, I'm just like getting all these ropes and stuff to making sure it doesn't fall anywhere. <laughs> but I feel more comfortable with the, um, they do make um, magnetic ones. And then you also have the option um, I know Hollywood does this a lot where they put the car on a trailer and they'll rig the lights on the trailer and they'll rig the camera on the trailer as opposed to rigging it to the car. And then, you know, the trailer will be hooked up to a truck and the truck will just drive around the block. And then I think, Lakota, did you say something like that as well? Like the actors won't even be, they'll put the car in neutral. Yeah, the process trailer. Yeah, they'll put the car in neutral. So that sounds really expensive. It's not as expensive today as it was back in the day. Um, they do make these, um, they make a hitch where it's like the front of your car, like it'll pull the front of your car and you could rig up the side and just pull the car around on the, on a, like on a pickup truck, you know, you would rig it on the back of the truck and the car itself is like the wheel, it's in neutral and then the truck will pull it. So they do make, there is, more ideal options um, for kind of going that route. Like if you want to go, I've never done it. Um, I know somebody else that has, and it looked pretty cool. Um, but then again, like regardless if you're using mounts or regardless if you're rigging a trailer up or anything like that, you still have to go to the pro go through the process of finding a uh, smooth road 
because regardless of you know what your setup is if you've got a lot of potholes and stuff it's just not gonna look good at all so you have to find a, a nice smooth road to do it on regardless right. and then uh, well there is another option um there was a guy that i was watching on uh, one of his videos and he had a lot of um exterior car shots where you know the cars were like zooming in and out and they were doing these crazy things he had taken a drone and he had mounted it onto the trailer hitch of his car or his SUV, and um, you know the drones they have a little gimbal. So he he said he had his wife drive, and and you know he was on the the phone with the the other drivers of the car, and then he was in the passenger seat, you know, controlling the gimbal remote. Mm-hmm. I thought that was pretty cool, and I thought that was pretty effective. Like, um, kind of similar to what you were showing with the uh, uh, that really expensive car with the um the crane on top of it he was getting he was getting shots like those i mean he wasn't being he wasn't he wasn't able to go up and down but he was able to pan like this oh wait i like that but that. yeah i believe uh, the you know there is uh, this option in the drone where you can ask it to just follow you yeah there's that too right and yeah there is. The, yeah, the car, uh, you can, if it's following the car, it's like, you know, or maybe uh, preceding the car, you can probably get a good shot. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I thought that was, I, I'll show you the video the guy sent me, but I asked, I was like, how did you get those shots? He was like, yeah, I just, I just um, duct taped the drone to the hitch of the hitch of my car. And, you know, because the drone has a gimbal on there, he was able to pan left and right, get all these other cool shots and stuff. And I was like, I never thought of that. I thought that was cool because normally when I do shots like that, I always have um, my mount. I'll put, I'll put the mount on the trunk of the car, and then I'll be on the phone, and then you know I'll give the you know order speed up, slow down, go left, go right, you know this, that, and the other. Mm-hmm. But you know it's kind of just stuck there. You know the camera. I can't move the camera because the camera's on the back of the trunk. But to be able to be able to pan left and right, or you know tilt up and down is like a big thing. So I never thought about that. Yeah. So that's another of the, Interesting. Of the I won't even, I probably won't even fly the drone. I'll just use it to, to get these car shots on the back of the drone. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that is pretty cool. But yeah, that's a that's one thing I wanted to bring up to everybody anyway. It's just like you guys don't I know we're talking about gear this semester, we're talking about all these different pieces of equipment. But like Brian keeps bringing up, don't think you need the most expensive thing. Don't think you need every single piece of gear. Um, I just wanted to go in depth for each piece. And just so if anyone is wanting to buy these things or just so you know what's out there, just so you know you have the option for this or that, or there's a specific case of use for these different scenarios. But you don't really need every single piece of gear. You can get a lot done with different pieces of gear. A lot of people... um, will use like like he's saying a drone for different things now and you can really start to get creative with the way you get shots done and you can still make them look nice you can still make them look good same thing with lighting and like using reflectors and using negative fill and using outdoor locations but using the sun as your light and then just natural light but but shaping that natural light with diffusion and um reflection and um, negative fill same thing with gear you can always it's more about your ingenuity and how you get it done compared to like what kind of gear you have and if you have the best and the most expensive gear and don't ever be feel restricted by what you don't have try to figure out a way to get around it around how you can get that same shot done or how you can get that stuff done by um just being creative with it and and coming up with a way to get it done without that gear, because you're not always going to be able to have or afford every single piece of gear. Even if you have the, even if you have every single piece, even if you can afford it, you might not have the time or the space to bring every single thing um, that you need. So that's also something to consider. It's just like, we're talking about gear, but don't think you need every single thing. It's just, this is what's out there. This is what you can get. Um, and there's going to be different price ranges. There's going to be different use cases. There's going to be different things and different reasons to need or want this stuff. So 
Um, that's something I wanted to mention, which I think also goes into tips for advice for low budget. Somebody said that, but uh, that's something that I just wanted to bring up again. Um, I forgot to mention that some of the brands for sliders that you'll come across are Rhino, Manfrotto, or Manfrotto, I think it's Manfrotto, Rat Rig, uh, Moza, GVM, Zecti, and Newer. So those are some of the brands you'll come across, um, some of the more uh, higher rated brands or more common brands that you'll come across if you're trying to look for a slider. All right. So the last thing we're talking about, we were only able to get through about half of this stuff, um, but it was just how to make low budget. Tips and advice for low budget filmmaking. I don't know, low budget house. Let's just see if we can bring up some pictures that have to do with this. But anyway, um, so we only got through about like a few, few resources with this. Um, we will get to more and talk about the rest of it. If there's any new information that are, is different or something we forgot to bring up, talk about that Thursday. But um, I'll go over what we got to. So this first stuff is from Wolf Crow, letter A in the videos, how to make a low budget movie or short film. And he goes into talking about, so everybody's talking about they want to shoot at 4K, 6K, you know, and those things are great. But when you're shooting something on a lower budget, first of all, the camera will be cheaper if it's 1080p. Second of all, movies shown in theaters are shown in 2K, which is just a little bit above 1080p right now. Um, and they're still doing that. They're not really showing in 4K, um, at least not yet. I mean, it might start taking off. Streaming services have started showing 4K and standard HD. And usually you can't um, get the stuff onto those platforms without having 4K unless it's something recognizable or something pretty big. I know Netflix and Amazon and those other companies will um, purchase independent films that don't have 4K, but they usually, you'll have a better chance of getting it on those platforms if you do shoot it in 4K. But with like movie theaters and with just distributing online and having your own platform or self-distributing and things like that, he says shooting in 1080p will help cheapen the budget. First of all, you're going to have a cheaper camera, so it's not going to be as expensive to rent or to buy. If you have a camera, um, you don't need that 4K. The memory is not going to be as expensive because it's not going to take up as much room and space as 4K. Uh, it's going to be a cheaper editing setup. Your computer won't need to be as advanced. Um, you won't need to do as many steps. 1080p will just be a little bit easier to work with because it's just it's not as taxing on your computer. And lastly, 1080p is going to hide some of those things that make the low budget production look low budget. Some of the mistakes, some of the production design, some of the things that you don't really want there to be too much um, focus in that you don't really want to be have too much detail in because the more detail there is, they might start noticing that there's a wig on the character or they might start noticing that they're wearing makeup because the makeup's not professionally done. And, the production design behind, they're going to notice that that's not really a rock. That's not really a cave. That's just styrofoam because it wasn't professionally done. So there's some reasons why you might want to have 1080p on a lower budget film because it'll help reduce some of that detail. And that's not always a bad thing, especially when the set, the actual production design is good, but it's not Hollywood production level design or it's not Hollywood production makeup or it's not Hollywood hair and all of those other things. So some of the mistakes that you might make with focusing, some of the production design mistakes, things like that will be less in detail. Everything will be less detailed just a little bit, especially more than like four or 6K. And so then they won't be as noticeable as they would be if um, you're showing it in 4K. So sometimes it actually benefits your movie more than the gates, just because it doesn't have as much detail. Um, and sometimes that can be a good thing. 
And then he goes on to say, when you are writing a script, if you're the one writing it, or if you know a script writer and they're trying to make it, or if you're picking up a script, you're going to take somebody else's script. Um, try to either write it out or adjust it to be a small world, have less locations, less characters, have it be local. Don't doesn't need to be one scene is in Africa and one scene's in a desert and one scene's in the Grand Canyon. It's all over the place and it's all these locations and it's all these different things. And it might add some production value and variety to your film, but then you have to actually find locations for all of that. You have to actually travel to those different locations or places or things that look like those places. And that can be a lot more expensive. So when you're working um, for it on a low budget, one of the things you wanna do is you wanna start limiting your characters, limiting your locations and making it a little bit more local so that there's less travel, less costs. Actors, crew, you wanna to try to bring them in from around your area if you can, because if you're having people travel from out of state, if they're um, typically, you're probably gonna to have to pay for either their flight or drive, their hotel stay, their travel and all of that. And so that'll be more expensive. So on a budget, you wanna to try to see if you can find people locally. Uh, he also says, think about the resources that you already have, the locations that you have available. You know, maybe you know uh, your best friend's dad works at a local grocery store. Maybe you can get that location and have a little grocery store. Maybe your best friend's um, house is available. Maybe your house is available. Maybe you have a garage. Maybe you have a basement. Maybe you have a cellar. You know, all of these different things that you might have access to or that you might know people that have access to them and are willing to let you use them. Things that you want to think about whenever you are um, looking into making something is some stuff you already have available, locations especially, because that will really cheapen that cost. If you, and then you can start maybe, even if you don't have a story yet, if you already know what kind of resources you have, if you know the kind of locations you have, um, you can start writing around those locations maybe. And then the story's more reflected in that location and maybe it'll stand out more anyway. Um, you also, what kind of props you might have already, you know, what kind of wardrobe, do you have any actor or crew friends that you know that might be willing to help you out and volunteer? And that's one of the main things that hopefully comes from this is, you know, if we already did a short film and we got a lot of people from this group to help us out because you guys know us. And if Brian needed it or, you know, Chisom, V, Vish, if any of you guys ever did something, you wanted people to come help, me and Priscilla were willing to help. So there you go. You know some people that can do it. But do you have other people that you know, other actor friends or other people that might be willing to work on your project, um, volunteer, because that's a good thing to always have is people that, that kind of uh, that have a little bit that know what they're doing or have an interest in it at least um, that are willing to help out. And then again, and then uh, lastly, like what kind of gear do you already own? You know, do you already own a camera? Do you already own lighting equipment, stuff like that? Or are you gonna have to rent or buy it all for the project? If you already own it, then can you do your project on that gear? Like you mentioned earlier in his video, he said 1080p cameras. Maybe you have a 1080p camera, but you were thinking you needed a 4K. Well, maybe you can make your film with that 1080p since you already have it. Um, you can already make your film with it. So then you're gonna not have to rent or buy a new thing. And you're also going to have that cheaper workflow. It's not necessarily ideal, especially when everybody wants 4K now, but it does help cheapen that budget and make it a little bit, um, anywhere you can cut costs is better, especially when you're working on a very low budget. So just think about all the resources you have available and think about what you can do with those resources and what you can make out of it possibly. Again, especially when you're writing your script, he says, you wanna think about these things. You kinda of wanna reverse engineer the whole thing. Instead of writing your script, doing the schedule and the budget and planning around that, you kinda of wanna think about it 
backwards, as in what do I have available? And then write a script around what you have compared to writing a script and then getting things based on what that script entails. So it's kind of the backwards way of doing it, but it does really make it a lot cheaper to get it done. And it makes the story really reflect and involve the things that you have available to you already. So it, um, it isn't really cutting anything out of the script. If you're at the script stage, it's a great way to start working on it, get creative and figure out how can I use this space? Again, if you have a basement, it could be, you could turn it into a bomb shelter or something, and then you can make a whole story around that. But, um, or you can just turn it into something about a basement. Somebody's getting, you know, trapped in a basement. Somebody got tied up and put in a basement. There's a killer, any kind of thing that you can think about with a basement. Somebody's having a party, whatever. It doesn't matter, but you, as long as you're like thinking about that while you're writing the script, it'll just, it'll come across a little more. I mean, we created an interrogation room in a basement and that worked, so. Yeah. Sometimes if it's a, just one room, you can convert that area of the basement with some wallpaper, some lighting like we did, you know, mm -hmm. uh, put it, put it, some furniture in there, you can transform it into different kinds of rooms. Exactly. So that's the first thing that if you're writing your script out or if you haven't written it yet or you don't have an idea or you have maybe an idea, um, think about the resources you have if you know it's going to probably have to be low budget just because, you know. You might get creative and come up with a better story than you would if you just made whatever kind of story you want anyway. And you might make it more personal and more character driven even, depending on how limited you can get with the characters and locations, then the uh, characters will be paramount compared to big action movies where they have them or the big uh, fantasy that might have the scenery be the main thing or things like that. So on a lower budget, you really want to think more about story and character than the scenes and the scenery and action pieces because those are a lot more expensive to do. Um, oh, and he brought this up, so that's where I got it. Well, I already knew about it, but don't get bogged down by the gear you don't have. Be innovative, use what you can, and be creative. Um, and then I added, I thought of some things that you know I've seen people use, white trash bags or t-shirts for diffusion. If you don't have enough money to buy a, a professional diffusion material, white trash bags or t-shirts or a white sheet can work. Black trash bags in place of duvetine or something that you can cover the windows and block out light with. Um, using a shirt or a towel and a camera on top of a table and dragging it across you have the uh, towel laying on the table and then you put the camera on top of it and then you just grab the, the towel and you pull it forward and you, it's a dolly move. You know, it, it's so there's different things you can do around that stuff. If you don't have a flag set, you can use cardboard to block out some stuff. If you need some negative fill, you know, you can buy a um, black poster board from dollar tree for like 50 cents to a dollar if you don't have a reflector you can buy another white poster board from dollar tree for a dollar there's all these things you can do to really make it cheap it might look a little janky it might look a little ghetto but these things can still work if they're done with time if you think about it if you put thought into it ingenuity and creativity you can make some really great looking stuff with really cheap stuff. The stuff around the frame doesn't matter. It doesn't matter how ugly the set looks. What matters is what this final shot looks like. And so if you yeah, can like block out a live video, and you can do There was a, can, oh, sorry. I was just gonna say, there was a video we showed that they made a set almost entirely of cardboard. Like they, yeah. paint it, they painted the cardboard and they turned it into like a subway, if I'm not mistaken, like a subway scene. Right. And so like, they got creative and they thought, oh, we don't have the budget to buy, you know, prof like the, um, what was it? They used it mainly for in place of film, um, what is it called? Walls? Film set walls? 
I they used an in place of that and so that it was a cheaper option and so and it still worked for what they needed it to do because they got creative with it they said oh we only have the budget we don't have the budget for all of these materials for the wood and the different things to set them all up and uh but we have the enough money to maybe buy some cardboard and set it up like that and make a little space and they did so there's de definitely a ton of stuff you can do if you get and it looked out. awesome by the way it didn't look like super cheap and it looked really good if you went like super close and the lighting was bigger obviously you could tell but they did it in such to where the lighting was was like good dark enough to where you could see like enough to where it still looked really good and professional and realistic Right. Oh, and they use partially green screen as well, like a mix of the two. Yeah, but anyway, you, I mean, like you, well, yeah, not sorry, not anyway, but, but, um, but you can get really creative with it. You can do a lot of things with stuff that might not look the best, um, might be pretty ugly, but it will do the job. It'll do what's necessary. It might not look exactly the same or as good as some of the professional equipment that's made exactly specifically for that thing but it can get pretty close and you can make it still look really good with what you have available you just have to get creative with it and really think where that's where i'm saying like the creativity doesn't end with the directing the production design and the um, camera and those other things that are that people think of when they think of creativity you also have to be creative with the budget. You have to be creative with figuring out problem solving and all of that stuff. So that's part of filmmaking too. And that's another part of where your creative mind can come into play. You can have technical expertise, but you also have to have some ingenuity and, and creativity to get around some things when you don't have the necessary gear or equipment that you would need for the most professional outcome of what the director or whoever is is, is uh, trying to get the shot of or go before so um so you have to also have that um or build that skill set and just really think outside the box and try to be creative with it all next he says if you know anyone that knows film actually i don't think this is wolf Girl anymore this is uh, something else if you if you know anyone that knows film or knows people that do uh, or knows other people that do know film try to get them to give you feedback on your script because there's likely going to be many things that can be improved or that might need to be removed so the guy that was talking about this um, I can't remember who exactly it was but he was saying that he wrote a script let me see if I can find it in the syllabus I think it might be D, how to make a successful no budget film. Anyway, he was saying that, um, you know, he wrote a script, his first feature, and he thought it was great. And he was thinking it was so good. And he had gone to film school and he had a, or not a film school, he went to a course for script writing. And so he had a teacher that he used to know that um, helped him out with the script writing. And so he sent her the script and he was thinking it was so good. And then she sent back a, a huge amount of notes and things that needed to be changed or kicked out or added and questions and comments on it all. And at first he felt like, oh man, I failed. But then he got over it and, and really put to work his uh, writing and, and figuring out ways to uh, either incorporate the feedback that actually made sense and worked for his film or to not listen to the stuff that he felt wasn't necessary. So that is also something you have to do. It's a tricky line, but you want to, when you're getting feedback, even if it's from people who have done films before, they might not know exactly what your vision is for it. So they might give you feedback that goes against your story or goes against your characters. Um, emotion at the time or their their uh, arc but you definitely want to consider every piece of advice you get every piece of information and uh, feedback you get because there's going to be a lot that's probably applicable for you to change it take it out or make it better there's pretty much never a perfect script you're always going to have problems you're always going to have something that can be improved so 
the more you can get feedback on those things that need to get improved and the better it can get with each iteration, the better it will be. And so you want to always get feedback and not just film it right after you ride it. You want to do a few drafts of it, even though it takes more time. And I would say, if nothing else, it's always good to practice that um, ability of being able to detach yourself from your work enough to look at it from a critical lens or allow someone else, a third party to look at it and objectively and take that criticism objectively because it can be like I've mentioned many times before it can be very easily it can be very easy for us to take it personally because it's something we created and it's very personal to us and we wrote it with a specific vision and thought in mind so sometimes you have to be able to see okay if I didn't have that idea already in my head would it still make sense? And that's where the third party comes in. And detaching yourself, being like, I still care about the story that I'm telling, but I can accept that it's prob like the writing of that story might have some, some things that might need working on. Or, or I can be open to listening to that critique, objectively listening to it and actually applying it or seeing if it applies to my work and saying yes or no to it. I feel like just because we filmed in a, it can also be art, doesn't mean that it can't be improved. Doesn't mean it's not also work that can be done in multiple drafts that can, that can have a critical eye. You know, just because it's a form of self-expression doesn't mean it can't also be viewed critically. Yeah, and so like when you're talking about low budget, of course you have to think about that you have to think you're not going to get because higher budgets they're getting feedback all over the place from the producers to the studio to executives to maybe the actors who want to sign on but they don't like some things in the script and there's all sorts of people that give input where the script might need to have changes and so that usually is for the best sometimes in huge studio productions depending on what they're main goal is, whether it's money or actually going for the story. Um, sometimes it can be bad. Yeah, I was going to say, I feel like the, bal the hard balance is knowing when to put your foot down and be like, you know what, I see where you're coming from, but I've made the necessary changes that I think I'm going to stick with this. The other because thing you do it's a hard line. Yeah, no, definitely. Because like there's yeah. there's because some things you don't want to be you you don't want to be arrogant about it, but you also want to be able to be firm in your ideas. Right. Because some things people just aren't gonna get until it's actually created. But yeah. but um I was gonna say you also try to wanna get uh multiple feedback from different people. So that way if everybody comes back to you with, I don't get why this character is doing this in this scene, you don't brush it off if one person says it. And you say like, well, they didn't know what that character was thinking at the moment. But if everybody's giving you that same feedback, then you're going to go, okay, I got to change something in this scene or the scene prior to make this make be more clear because it's not coming across. Yeah, because sometimes one to. person won't get it, but the other will. The other thing you want to think about when you're talking about lower budgets is the less shots you do means there's less setup and there's less time. Um, there's less time for you to set up, which means that you're going to have more done each production day, which means you'll need less production days total. So see if you can combine some shots and things like that. If you have a really tight budget, you want to try to do, you might have some longer shots. It might not be ideal for the attention span that you want to go for because you know everybody only likes to see something for three seconds or two seconds and then move on. But sometimes you just have to cut these corners when you have a low budget. Because the extra setups, when every time you change the camera around, you're going to have to change the lights. Every time you change the lights and the camera around, you're going to have to set up everything. Every time you do that, it's going to be more time. And so um, you want to try to see if you can just do the fewer shots, you can get that same emotion and scene across, the better. You know, so think about that. The more roles you do, you can do. Um, the less crew you might be able to get away with. So 
you'll see this a lot on lower budget productions where the director is the producer is the maybe the cinematographer and the script supervisor you know they're they're or they don't have a script supervisor they're just the ones over continuity they're kind of having to do everything they're the editor and that's just because they don't have enough money or don't know enough people that are willing to volunteer and so they kind of have to take those roles upon themselves, which is another reason why I think it's good for everybody to learn a little bit of everything. That way, if you have to, you can take over that specific thing and do it. And that'll save you a bunch of money. Also, one of the options you might want to go for is opting for black and white, black and white film, black and white cinema. It's a way you can cut down some of the time and costs since you don't have to worry about color temperatures for lights or the times of day because they're not going to really change too much as much as they would if you see the color of everything changing like when the sky starts turning orange and uh or when it's really like when the sun's straight above now the light is still going to come across in black and white so that is still going to be something to consider but it won't be as noticeable as it would be in color so some people actually opt to go for black and white just because it's a lot cheaper and it's easier to work with. Production design doesn't require as much, at least not color-wise, um, as much typically because you're not going to see the colors. So as long as it's coming across in the different shades of gray, you're good. And it might look a little more realistic. Who knows? Because it's not as noticeable. There's not as many different things you're seeing. So again, it's like taking out that detail from 4K to 1080p, taking out the detail of color. Um, you know, it might not be the best option for all, everything, especially depending on what you're going for, but it definitely is an option that a lot of people will go for to try to get their um, film done for, for cheaper. And another thing is using natural light as much as you can, if you are able to, if it works for your story, because that's a way that can really cut down setup time and gear costs. So you don't have to rent or buy as much stuff. You don't have to have the negative fill and the well you still have to have negative fill you don't have to have the production lights um, and things like that but you want to shape the natural light with negative fill reflection and um, diffusion so those are all some things to consider and think about whenever you're trying to make a, a film on a low budget depending on how low budget you go you want to try to get people that you know that are local, less places, less locations, less characters, make a more contained story, a more contained world, don't have to travel all over the place, things like that. And um, less, I would say less effects heavy, you know, less specific things that would need like special effects makeup or visual effects or CGI, things like that are gonna be really expensive. If, if you want to make them right. Um, so you might want to opt to take those out and really contain that story and, and still make it work. The emotion and the story should still be there. Uh, you just have to work around some things that you wanted for your dream picture of it. Um, so those are some things to consider. That's all really I had for that for now. We'll get into the rest of this Thursday. Um, if there's any new information that wasn't mentioned just now, but basically the main thing is just don't be, don't feel, um, don't feel like you have to make your movie worse because you don't have the budget. Just get creative with figuring out how can I still make this with the budget I have? How can I get around this thing? And how can I use the gear I have and the locations I have and the people I know? to really make something great. All right, so for Thursday, like I said, we're gonna go over the rest of this stuff if there's anything else. Um, and we're also gonna talk about light stands. I'm gonna go into detail of like what to look out for. It's probably gonna be pretty similar, if not very similar to tripods, but we'll get into that. Continuity editing, graphic, rhythmic, spatial, and temporal relations. So we'll talk about what that all means and um, what that means in editing. And the last thing is end credits. 
you know, what are the rules? What are the unsaid and I mean, unspoken and spoken rules for credits? Who goes first? And all of that kind of thing. We'll talk about that stuff all Thursday. Last thing I want to mention is that we still have all three of our exercises and they're going to be due next Monday. So that'll be the 28th. Next Monday, we're going to be doing those three exercises as well as a few other things, but um, a few other topics that we'll go over on that day, but it's really just something quick. The main thing is going to be seeing those exercises. So whoever wants to do those, be sure to have them done Monday. All right, I think that's going to be everything. Appreciate it, everyone. Have a good night. Good night, everyone. All right, see y'all on Thursday. Yep, see you then. <laughs>